Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and we're back with yet another response to a Wisecrack video. Um, I have not watched this one yet, just so you all know. Uh, so I'm going into this fresh, just like you might be. Uh, then again, you will find uh, the link to this video in the description below. It is called Jordan Peterson Doesn't Understand Christianity. Uh, it has been recommended to me uh, by my uh, by the wonderful denizens of my Discord server, also linked below. So come join us, come check it out, um, come discuss this monstrosity. Um, oh, I'm told, I'm told it's a monstrosity. I'm told that it's really bad. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm yet to find out. Uh, I might be pleasantly surprised. I don't expect to be, but we'll see. Uh, my guess from the outset, and we'll just put this on record, just knowing that I haven't seen this and I have no idea what's to come yet. My guess is that our presenter doesn't understand Christianity <laughs> and is instead just going to be accusing Jordan Peterson of not understanding Christianity. So let's have a look, shall we? Uh, so once again, if you want to see the original video, it is down in the description. If you want to see it first, go to that first and then come back here and see my reaction to it. But I am going to be watching the whole thing. Uh, by the look of things, this is a little bit long. This is a 30-something minute video, so buckle up. I don't know what this time code is going to actually say right now, uh, but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's high. All right. Here we go. And as usual, I will be pausing throughout. Uh, to give some of my commentary and feedback here. Oops, I did it again. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm back to talk about the public. And that's a that's a great start. I uh, I don't I don't sound like this, do I? I don't I don't begin with cringe, do I? I hope not. Intellectual that our era deserves Jordan Peterson. Now, in the past, I've looked at his critiques of postmodernism and Marxism, but today, well, let's put on our Sunday best because it's time to take Dr. Peterson to church. Now, that's because in recent years, he's been speaking and writing and tweeting more and more about Christianity, uh, specifically Roman Catholicism. And he's been sort of grafting his political views onto this religious framework. Okay, so a little odd. Um, okay, first of all, the, the reason he's been talking more about Roman Catholicism in particular is because uh, his wife just recently converted to Roman Catholicism. Praise be to God. Uh, last year, I think, uh, as of this recording, I think it was, it was in 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so naturally, when someone very important to you uh, in your life uh, is basically saved by uh, by a religious tradition, you're going to take it a little bit more seriously, I should think. Um, and he certainly seems to be. And I have been saying, I've been on record saying, you can go back through old live streams, old discussions, uh, even my... I'll put a link to it in the description. Um, my um, video about Pascal, uh, one of my videos about Pascal at least, that uh, that Peterson really does need to take Christianity and especially Catholicism a little bit more seriously um, than he had been at that time. That being like 2017, 2018, into 2019, that era, um, where he wasn't really taking the faith all that seriously. Um, now, now, yeah, I will say he is. He seems to be. He's been talking with, he's been talking with some very um, well-read, well-respectable uh, theologians, philosophers, about theological topics for once. So, awesome, great. Now, where uh, where Wisecrack says uh, that he is grafting his political ideology onto Christianity, I have seen that on Twitter, but really just on Twitter because Twitter is a hellscape, and everyone knows that. Um, but in his actual professional presentations, um, I would not say that that Peterson is all that. He is involved politically insofar as he is uh, he's in constant battle with political organizations, especially the Canadian government. Um, but that is not something that he really grafts onto Christianity. It's more his his ideological commitments that he is uh, that he is finding uh finding to be the congruous or incongruous with Christianity. Uh, that's more what's going on. But of course, to uh, to somebody like Wisecrack, who I take, I take to be rather influenced, uh, rather significantly influenced by, uh, by various sort of Marxist schools of thought, um, anything is in some way political, right? Especially anything, anything ideological, anything, uh, anything deeply philosophical or metaphysical is going to be political in some sense. And so I think that's what he's getting at here. So let's continue. Now, I find it a little bit surprising just because Peterson is a trained psychologist who has often framed his work around detailed logical arguments grounded in scientific reason and not faith. But now he's attacking... <laughs> 
Why? Why? Is it because is it because your baseline assumption is that the faith is contrary to reason? Because if that's it, then you're an idiot. Oh my god. I have been told, by the way, that this guy is formerly Catholic. And I understand why it's formerly. Because he's one of those uh one of those uh, I went to Catholic school types, or I went to Sunday school, and never, then never learned anything beyond that fifth grade level of education that you get in, get in Sunday school. Oh, man. <laughs> the surprise that he expresses here that an, intellect, that an intellectual person could find Catholicism serious and compelling is really just... Man, it's... It's really commonplace, uh, although it's a little bit passe. This hasn't been kind of the thing since the new atheism kind of died away 10 years or so ago. Um, but like I said, it's still somewhat common, and it's it's very sad. It's very, very deeply uh, disappointing to see that that is still a common view uh, held by, uh, I believe at least, uh, intellectually sophisticated philosophical types. Anyway, I'm going to back up a few seconds to to before I started uproariously laughing and try and restrain myself this time. He often framed his work around detailed logical arguments grounded in scientific reason and not faith. But now he's attacking atheists as another enemy in the ever expanding culture war. You know, well, they are. So, you know, um, I, I, I will say, right, uh, a lot of atheists are uh, are enemies of uh, of carefully. Uh, how did he say it? Um, careful intellectual processes of reason. Now, not all atheists, there are clear thinking and clever atheists, a lot of whom Peterson has respectful conversations with, and a lot of the a lot of the theologians and philosophers that he talks to, the Christian ones, have respectable conversations with. Uh, a lot of them are on YouTube, um, far, far more of them are in the academy. Um, and so, yeah, there are atheists who are intellectually respectable, but man, go to Reddit, and you will not find a single intellectual as distinct from pseudo-intellectual atheist. Maybe that's exaggerated, but not by much. Oh, it's like, first I came for the atheist, they came for the atheist, and I did nothing. Then they came for the weird online Marxist, and I did nothing. Like, he's coming for you next. Now, it's important to note that while Peterson... Don't put that on me. I'm not a Marxist. I, I accused you of being a Marxist. What's going on here? Anyway. As long discussed religious mythology in both his academic and public work uh, via his Jungian perspective, in recent years, there's been a shift. And now he's talking about it from a position of personal faith and has even called for young men to go back to church. I mean, oh God. Get this off my screen. He has, um, he has kind of done that already, though, right? Um, even going back as far as the, the, I mean, really going back as far as Maps of Meaning, his book, um, which, which I, I, to be fair, I have not read Maps of Meaning. I did watch his entire course on it, the lecture series. Phenomenal. If you have not watched it, take the time. If only because he's a spectacular, spectacular classroom teacher. Um, and honestly, I learned a lot more about teaching from watching those lectures than I learned about psychology. Um, but he does, even all the way back then, which those were recorded probably 10 years ago now, 2014 or 15-ish, something like that. Um, he goes into a, grid, a good deal of uh, taking responsibility for one's life and doing things that will uh, that will force you to hold yourself accountable, which is which church does. And so this is nothing new. This is nothing new at all. It's just new that he's doing so from an internal perspective, which, which again, just, okay, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, this kind of maps onto uh, what Pascal would have us do as far as entering into the faith. Right? So Pascal has the famous wager, right, that we should bet on God, that it's a better bet to believe that God exists than to disbelieve, right? That you stand to gain more than you stand to lose. That's the unimportant part. That's just basically how Pascal is trying to get you to just make a decision. Because his main point is, you have to make a decision about believing or not believing. And that once you've made that decision, it comes down to a matter of, of inculcating a genuine belief within yourself. And that involves acting as if, say, Christianity is true. Which is what Peterson has been saying he's been doing for at least five years now. Uh, and so... I think that it's it is a brilliant illustration of Pascal's point, which is that if you act as if you believe, that will remove any kind of psychological barriers that you might have to genuine belief. And then it gets you out of your own way for a miracle to happen, for God to grant you grace. Right? That's that's Pascal's perspective here, because he is a um, more or less doctrinaire Catholic. Um, he has a little bit of 
a uh, little bit of uh, friendliness to Jansenist heresies, but but even that is a little bit even, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because this is a little bit outside my historical area. Um, I wasn't expecting to talk about this for some reason. I should have been. Um, that that he, he's, if anything, he's a little bit more prone to um, divine sovereignty and, and single predestination, that sort of thing. Um, but but either way, right? It, the point is that that by by acting as if you believe, you get out of your own way. You eliminate any kind of passion barriers, barriers that your passions put up to genuine faith, and then God can come in with a miracle and, and grant you grace and and make your uh, your your artificial belief genuine, something like that. So I think that's largely what's happened to what's been happening to Dr. Peterson, and we've been kind of watching it happen, which is, which, thank you, uh, Dr. Peterson, for, for taking us along this journey with you. I think this is a brilliant thing for everyone to see. Out it from a position of personal anyway. faith, and has even called for young men to go back to church. <laughs> and this seems to be part of a larger turn in which practitioners of what we might call a certain online logical conservatism are heading back to religion, and in particular, really traditional forms of Christianity. Wait, 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 is he saying Matt Walsh is heading back to religion? Or is he saying that, that more people are following people who are more traditionally religious? Because if it's the latter, okay, fine. But as far as I know, Matt Walsh has never not been Catholic. Um, and if he's talking about, you know, the Daily Wire folks, uh, the only one of the, the main Daily Wire cast who's had a major religious conversion was, was Andrew Claven, And he was a sort of Hollywood leftist. And then he became, um, I think, some kind of an evangelical. Uh, but Walsh was always always pretty traditionally Catholic. Knowles was always Catholic, but he was nominally Catholic for a while, if I remember right, and he just sort of started taking his faith seriously in his 20s, that sort of thing. Um, but but yeah, I don't I, I assume what he's getting at here is that this sort of right wing audience or this right wing audience is starting to take uh, traditional religion seriously, which I mean, first of all, good. Because if the right is to mean anything, if right, if the if conservatism is to mean anything, it should be rooted in in tradition, and a large part of that tradition is uh, is traditional uh, traditional religion, and I'll say Catholicism specifically, but but beyond that as well, uh, to fine um, conservatism as it exists in in sort of the Anglosphere today has Protestant roots as well, so whatever, fine, but. Again, it should be rooted in something, and the truth is as good a thing as anything to be rooted in. Probably better. This includes both people like Peterson and edgelord hipsters like the host of the podcast Red Scare. Please don't tell them I said that, because they legitimately scare me. But Who? I actually don't know these people, um, but based on the shirt and whatnot, I assume it's Islamic, which is an interesting trend to uh, to observe, because you do have um, especially sort of like red pillar manosphere types who move who are moving in the direction of uh, of... I'll say really traditionalist Islam. Uh, you get the Andrew Tate types and that sort of thing. Uh, so, but but yeah, I think there is a there is a tendency towards that, and I think it, a lot of it is just because of disillusionment with the um, the secular the secularization of the West, and that pushing back against that can take all sorts of forms. It can take a healthy form, Catholicism. It can take uh, an unhealthy form, like 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 Islamic extremism. So. Pick your favorite. Okay, let's back up a sec. Both people like Peterson and edgelord hipsters like the host of the podcast Red Scare. Please don't tell them I said that because they legitimately scare me. But it feels a little bit ironic that all of this is occurring at the moment that the Catholic Church has their most progressive pope ever. And we'll talk. Oh my God. Come on, man. All right. Let, we're, I, I'm told that we're going to get into this a lot more. But say what you will about Francis. Um, uh, but His Holiness has, uh, has a lot of has a lot to say about the excesses of the left as much as he has to say about the excesses of the right the difference is that they don't get reported on as much in the media because the secular media wants to portray him as kindly uncle frank uh and that doesn't jive well with his reference his various things uh things like when he uh when he referred to the the international abortion industry as uh as a holocaust and directly compared it to the holocaust so yeah take i mean that's who you're that's who you're promoting lefties come on like be careful here people okay all right hold on i'm told he has more to say about this so i'm gonna hear him out 
more about this later. Also, I'm not here like stand up for the Catholic Church. This isn't where Catholic Burns comes out and I'm like, this has all been a front to bring you back to the Holy Roman Church. Not what I'm doing here, just to be clear. Uh, so today only. I want to look at some of Peterson's recent work and ask, what is it about Christianity? <laughs> recent work and he shows a lecture from Maps of Meeting. This is, like I said, this is almost 10 years ago he's so attracted to? Is his thought being genuinely shaped by an earnest engagement with Christian theology and spiritual practice? Is he grafting his own ideas onto the framework of religion to expand his own region influence? Or is he just looking to do transphobia in pretty rooms with stained glass windows? Okay, before we get into it, I have a confession to make. Um, this might come as a shock to some of you, but I'm bald. Now, while there's no going back for me, I know that not every guy out there dreams oh, of okay. rocking the world. Right, 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 since two right. out of three let's, men let's will experience not. male pattern baldness of some kind by the time they're 35, let's skip you're the in the same boat I was in college. I'm balding too, like don't, no worry. don't worry about that's it. I get it. Be wrong, it's a philosopher thing. Hair loss. Go to keeps.com slash wisecrack. Moving That's K along. They're not sponsoring this video. Slash wisecrack. Thanks for letting me make that so. confession, guys. It really really felt like I was back at church. Uh, but now let's get back to the show. Okay, let's... Come on, man. That's not how confessions work. This is actually funny. I, uh, I've, I've encountered recently um, some some uh, evangelical types who talk about confession in this way. Uh, and, they, and because outside the Catholic Church, a lot of Protestant groups do corporate confession, so they confess to their congregation. Uh, as a way of as a way of pursuing forgiveness, like Catholics do the sacrament of reconciliation, uh, but without but non sacramentally. And man, I've been seeing a lot of complaints that uh, of things like, oh well, I just confessed this uh, this this torrid thing that I've been I've been going through, and what do you know? Suddenly, I'm having to deal with the I'm suddenly having to deal with the gossip uh, from all the church ladies. And I'm just like, yeah, that's. There's a reason for the seal of confession. It is to encourage you to be able to to confess and be forgiven without having to worry about all of that, because that is an additional burden that is unnecessary and undue. So if if he was really wanting to confess his baldness, uh, maybe he wouldn't be wearing the cap. Maybe maybe the cap is uh, just a, just one of those like it's 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 that same source of embarrassment. And I'm just saying you don't need to you don't need to confess your baldness to us and the internet. Go to the priest. Not that it's a sin, right? Being bald is not a sin. Uh, it's a deficiency of some sort, but uh, but more of a physiological one. So anyway, damn, that was quite an aside. Let's move on. To jump in because today I'm going to take a philosophical and even theological look at Jordan Peterson's oh, religious turn. Part I of the reason that Peterson's religious inclinations are interesting to me as a philosophy person is that according to Tim Lott, uh, who's pretty pro-Peterson, he is a Christian, but more on the pattern of existential Christians, such as Soren Kierkegaard or Paul Tillich, than anything yep. to be found in the Midwest Bible Belt. You probably know at this point, friends, that, that Kierkegaard's kind of my guy. Um, and, you know, I also enjoy the Midwest. A lot goes on to write that Peterson is not, rather surprisingly, only a philosophical Christian. When I ask him whether he actually believes that Jesus physically rose from the dead, he is unable to answer. <laughs> Let me know. I mean, he doesn't say no. Um... It, that is a that is an interesting thing that he I think that he thinks it's not it is for some reason not the point to him, which 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 I mean, he is missing the point there. He's missing the point. And that's its own issue. Um, and I think that there are plenty of people working on him, working on him there. Um, but that's a that's a big hurdle for him to jump, I think. And he, he it's, it's a barrier. It's one of those. Honestly, it's one of those um, one of those barriers of pride. Right. It's one of those things where um not so much Kierkegaard, but with uh, but but Pascal, but we can apply this to Kierkegaard as well. Uh, that the Knight of Faith uh, has to take the take the leap of faith, and that that requires kind of uh, kind of um, uh, subsumation of self to that which is higher than oneself, which which requires a great deal, perhaps in a, perhaps a miraculous amount of humility, and that is not something that can be can be easily done, and if perhaps it can't be done without the direct supernatural aid of god and so if that is the case then then yeah i get it i understand why the the the, the supernatural and miraculous claims of christianity are such a hurdle for a strict naturalist at least pre previously a strict naturalist like peterson um no, strict naturalist but at the same time um I get the impression that his metaphysics are intentionally vague and he keeps it vague in his mind so he doesn't have to answer and reconcile with these difficult questions. And that's always been a problem I've had with him and a criticism I've had. But uh, but but the 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 necessity to that sort of take that leap in that Kierkegaardian sense is uh, is is a problem for him still. So anyway, let's see his commentary here. Oh, in the comments. If you think Jesus physically rose from the dead, that sounds like a fun call to action. So if Peterson is supposedly an existential what? Christian, like my friend Kierkegaard, and an explicitly philosophical Christian, then I feel like analyzing this philosophical... Inexplicitly philosophical Christian. What am I? Like, 
what what have been most Christians throughout Christian history, the history of Christendom? Sorry, but like you you've done videos on Thomas Aquinas and Anselm of Canterbury. What? I, uh, God, okay. I don't understand the inexplicable here. This seems this seems like way unnecessarily derogatory towards religion. It's very strange. Like I thought this wasn't cool anymore. Or it wasn't at least the thing to do, you know. It seems like that this is kind of passe since the new atheism sort of died out. But again, this seems, I don't know, it seems weirdly anachronistic, relic of the past kind of thing. Eh, eh. Philosophically tinged faith is very much in my wheelhouse. All that to say is, is you can trust me right now. Normally you don't, normally I'm a little dangerous, but today we can trust each other. I'm going to look at a few clips from various videos sure. and lectures, along with some of his recent spicy tweets. Now, like the previous Jordan Peterson videos we did, I watched a ton of stuff. Um, I have a document with way too much info in it, so I'm really going to narrow it down. Um, and, you know, we did a whole video series in the book of Exodus, but I only watched a little bit of it because I didn't want to pay money to the Daily Wire. But if you do want more of this stuff, I can maybe do an outtakes episode of Wisecrack Live that you can check out. Okay, I want to start by looking at a video that Peterson put out relatively recently, where he offers some unasked for advice to the Christian church uh, that's specifically focused on the idea that the fellas need to get themselves to mass immediately. When they are children, Boys are hectored for their toy preferences, which often include toy weapons such as guns, and their more boisterous playing style, as boys require active rough and tumble play, even more than girls, for whom it is also a necessity. Okay, I'll stop there, but the point he's making is that boys specifically need to play with toy guns and, and just beat the shit out of each other, and that our society mm -hmm. has made us docile little beta cucks, or something like that, and it's, it's interesting that so early in a video that's supposed to be about the church, he's just falling into these pretty played out uh, gender dynamics, doesn't feel very good, but he's going to keep talking about this. But I just okay, yeah, I mean, that's just true. Come on. Do you have children? I mean, to be fair, my oldest daughter is 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 crazy and rough and out there. But but she's also very still girly in that sense. And while my my middle son is is he's very quiet and introspective. He still OK, let me illustrate the difference. My oldest, my daughter, when she picks up a stick. It is, it is a wand. It is a walking stick. It is blah, 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 whatever it might be. When my son picks up a stick, it's a club or it's a sword. It is a weapon. It is assumed to be a weapon, right? And I, that is not my influence because I taught, I've taught, I've played sword fighting with the both of them, but their immediate instinct is very obvious. The distinction could not be clearer. And, and I have a, and I have a very outgoing and rambunctious daughter and a very introverted son. And the distinction is still just radical. Incredible. Um, again, this is not, this is not, this shouldn't be controversial. It is controversial because people don't open their eyes, but it, and people don't have children anymore. Um, these people don't have children anymore. Um, but again, that's not like, it's not like it's tired old gender norms. No, it's just, it's, it is a clinician recognizing uh, significant innate differences between young boys and young girls and then he's going to go ahead and draw some implications from it. I wanted to note that that's two minutes into the video. He's already going down this path. Of course you might think that I'm overstating the case. Think again, sunshine. <laughs> he says, he says, think again, sunshine. Um, I'm going to just right now, I'm going to rewind two seconds so I can see him say it again. Think again, sunshine. He okay, I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> okay. I have uh, I've recently pointed out that Jordan Peterson does not know how to chill. He has no chill whatsoever. And I... I there you go. Case in point. He goes on here to talk a little bit more about the way in which the Christian church should represent a sort of home of masculinity, of male culture, of domination. So let's watch him talk about that a little more and we'll dive a little bit deeper. The Christian church is there to remind people, young men included, and perhaps even first and foremost, that they have a woman to find, a garden to walk in, a family to nurture, an ark to build, a land to conquer, a ladder to heaven to build, and the utter terrible catastrophe of life to face stalwartly in truth, devoted to love and without fear. The terrible catastrophe of life. So let's, you know, think about this, right? He says that the church is there to remind primarily men that they, I like how the first thing he says they have a, a woman to find as if faith is primarily about marriage, a garden to walk in, a family to nurture. No, no, no. The church is feminine. Uh, it, it, in, okay. So, oh, Jesus. So this is archetypal. It's not about, uh, it's not about like getting married. Because if it were, he wouldn't be talking about the church, right? Uh, because uh, priestly celibacy is a higher calling, or even or even uh, consecrated uh, consecrated virginity of whatever of whatever sort is a higher calling than marriage. So, so no, he would not be going there. 
but it is that of course it is of course that even uh consecrated celibates do find the woman so to speak in the church because the church is the bride of christ this is a a kind of integration of the self into something higher that's what he's talking about he's not going into right he, he's not just talking about you know he's not talking about mario finding peach he's talking about the archetypal i mean he's talking about the hero's journey he is a union i mean after all it, it is this it is this um this need to seek something outside beyond and above oneself that's what he's getting at. That's a huge distinction that, that, that we're ignoring here. A land to conquer. So we have a sort of, mm -hmm. you, got, you got to fetch your woman, and then you got to go, I guess, do some colonization there. But there's an article about Peterson and the way he writes about gender, male desire, um, and femininity from a writer named Ashley Lenn. Again, it is about, it's about the establishment of order beyond oneself. And again, this is just, if you, if you want to read Genesis, this is, uh, this is God's command to Adam to cultivate the garden, to name the plants and animals it is the that which is the call to to science the naming of the plants and animals the, the taxonomy the taxonomy of them uh it is also the call to cultivate it the call to to take what is there and make it make something of it that was not there before out of the uh out of out of one's own self which is what uh what, i talk a lot actually I, maybe not as much as i should even uh this is this is um what done scotus uh, John John Scotus, a, a, a late 14th or late 13th, early 14th century uh, philosopher, says is the imago dei, is the image and likeness of God, is our creativity, our pa our capacity to create things ex nihilo, to take, to take to, to you put it in sort of Petersonian terms, if you will, to take chaos and give it order. That is our image of God, and so that is what he's pointing to here. It is not like manifest destiny or colonialism absurd uh oh here we go oh i just saw this title feminine chaos okay. lens who as far as i understand is a catholic writer so it's coming at this from a christian perspective she says there is nothing in peterson's writing that suggests that women are much more than commodified bodies which placate male desire inspire male violence or validate male status and success have you read peterson because that's not accurate at all Okay, let's see where if let's see if he defends this point at all. I I I don't expect him to, and I don't I don't feel the need to because first of all, in this point that he was he was making here, he's not talking about female bodies. Second of all, talk of female bodies is already intrinsically uh, dehumanizing. I, I hate that. I hate the the sort of the left's use of bodies to mean selves. It's it's reductionistic. It's 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 objectifying. It's lustful. It's Ugh, hate this. And the interesting thing here, and you might have seen this if you watched our previous Peterson videos, is he's very critical of Sorry, the idea that in his mind, you know, postmodernist and, and Marxist and leftist and all this sort of stuff only see the world in terms of, of hierarchies of power. But as Lenz sees it, it's true. that's basically what he's doing in the way he talks about Christianity. So she writes, Peterson's work not only describes, but actually endorses these systems of dominance, neglecting the fact that Christ swallowed up those kinds of hierarchies, making the first last and the last first, inverting and subverting the sinful way that men and women have sought to remake the world through power and, and violence. Um... But inverting and subverting is not destroying and doing away with. That's the whole point. Is it... You like Nietzsche, right? And not, maybe not you, the audience, but you, you, uh, Wisecrack, you like Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche pointed out that the Christian, this Christian act of subversion is not to eliminate hierarchies, but to invert them. Uh, it is to, that the last will be first. Uh, it is that it is that the meek shall inherit the earth. Those who, those who who will not rule through power will have authority. Again, another hobby horse of mine, this distinction between the two, that power is the exercise of dominance over uh, of one over the other, and that authority is the, the capacity to, to justly command, to say that you ought to do this, not because I say it, but because you ought to. And in the same sense that I will have, I have academic authority uh, to say what John Scotus has to say about the Imago Dei, because I've read a good deal of Scotus and I've learned from people who know a, a good deal more about John Scotus. And so I have authority to say, here's what you ought to believe about Scotus's view of the Imago Dei. If that were complemented by power, I could censor you for saying otherwise. I could punish you for getting it wrong, which I might be able to do in a classroom setting to a limited degree, to a very specifically limited degree, but not just in general. 
right? And that presumably, we presume, we as Christians presume, that power, just power, can only flow from licit authority. That it doesn't go the other way. Authority isn't based upon power. Power does not flow from the barrel of a gun, the Maoist sort of stipulation there. And so by, when Peterson says that uh, that the left, when Marxists, neo-Marxists, etc., see everything as a, a series of power dynamics, and then he talks about lobsters, and then he talks about dominance hierarchies and all that stuff, he is saying that these are sort of natural hierarchies of competence, that I have authority because I am right, because what I say is true, uh, rather than I am capable of overpowering someone else and, and making them subservient to my will. It's rather that they ought to be subservient to my intellect because my intellect is, is aligned with reality, and yours should be as well. That's the distinction here, and it's a distinction that is lost on, quite frankly, a lot of people, uh, not just on, on sort of leftist neo-Marxists, but it's lost on a lot of, even a lot of more traditional types who, who still conflate power and authority, or are too ready to conflate power and authority. And violence. So again, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that it's so important for Peterson that his new favorite thing, Christianity, is about men exhibiting some sort of divine power when, you know, right here, a, a Catholic writer sees... Because that's what Genesis is about. Right, the, the, the start of the Bible is God exercises power and then he grants man the authority to do likewise. That's, that's Genesis. That's it, that's what it is. There it is. That's, that's the, that's God's commission to Adam that is the great commission of Christ to the apostles. Go out and make disciples of all nations. That isn't saying, hey, you should go and uh, and just, you know, go. I don't know what he would be advocating here. Just go and just go worship or something, you know? No, he's saying, Christ is saying to the, to the apostles, go and make disciples of all nations. That does not mean forcefully, forcefully convert them, because that would be an exercise purely of power, not of authority but rather to bring, to go out, make the world into what it is not, but what it should be. All right, I'm going to move on before, before this, uh, before I, uh, before I, this is a bad frame to pause on. He's the faith is doing something completely different to that. Um, now he goes on and kind of wraps up with a, a call to action of sorts about what he thinks that we, especially we young men, um, are supposed to do. And in particular, we are not young men, <laughs> not any longer. I mean, I mean, to be fair, um, I, I don't know you, you, in my view, my view has really just sort of evolved over time. I used to think that you stop being a child when you're confirmed. Um, then I stop. I, then, uh, then I grew up a little further and I realized that now I'm still kind of a kid. Um, then for a while I thought, well, you know what? You stop being a child when you get married because it's the, it's the sort of final sacrament of, uh, sacrament of, of, uh, of your vocation. Right. Um, but at the same time, hmm, maybe you don't stop being a child until you have kids, you know? Um, but then, I mean, maybe I'm still a child and maybe you don't stop being a child until your kids are confirmed or maybe until your kids are married or maybe until your kids have kids until you have grandkids. I don't know, but, but the, the date keeps getting pushed back as to when you really become an adult. Um, I think I'm probably there, and, and I think we're both probably there. Then again, I have to guess, maybe I'm wrong, but I have to guess uh, that, uh, that, that he hasn't gone through uh, any of those last, those latter steps of, you know, marriage, having kids, that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe not, but he doesn't seem the type. That's mean. That's mean. If I'm wrong, I apologize. If I'm right... Uh, I still apologize for, for presuming, but you see where I'm getting at, right? That, that there is this tendency for, for aging millennials like myself to act like children uh, still, even after all these years of, of, and all these gray hairs that we all have. Like, anyway, and especially even to think of ourselves as young men, as children, as whatever. Anyway, sorry. What people that are, are Christians, that are religious, are supposed to do. Also, if you're a church leader, a priest, a pastor, anything of that sort, first of all, thanks for watching the channel. Second of all, let us know, I don't know, if you wanted Jordan Peterson's advice on how you should do your job. It's, I mean, yeah, probably. I want Jordan Peterson's advice on how to do my job. Like I just said, uh, like I said a little while ago, I, I'm i a teacher 
and so is he. And he's also a psychologist, and that's also useful information for me in teaching. Right? And so I watched his, like I said, I watched his Maps of Meaning lectures, especially with a keen eye open for teaching techniques of how to, how to draw and grasp and keep the student's attention uh, with complex topics. And I've learned a good deal. Uh, it's probably time I watch those again. Uh, it's been a while. And uh, I can use a refresher for that sort of thing. Uh, I like going back through and watching things of uh, watching uh, other other very good instructors instruct. And so I do think that I that you know I have a lot to learn. And I think that I think that you know the religious leaders, clerics, can take something away from this because they, because um, let me put it this way. Also, maybe this is a bit of a hot take, and I don't know if Dr. Peterson would agree with this, but maybe. Actually, he said something to this effect here and there, so maybe he would, that a lot of the current social role of the psychologist, the psychologist, or maybe even the psychiatrist, although that, that's maybe a bit of a, that might be a step too far, but certainly psychologist, is naturally the domain of the priest, or maybe the spiritual director. That a lot of, especially talk therapy, can be done and can probably be done better in a specifically religious context rather than a psychological context. And yet having some psychological knowledge can be conducive to that sort of thing, can be helpful for doing that sort of thing. So. Quit fighting for social justice. Quit saving the bloody planet. Attend to some souls. That's what you're supposed to do. That's your holy duty. Do it now. I'm not going to let him talk first. I'm going to say what he, what Peterson is talking about there. Because this is just clean your room, but religiously. He's been saying, stop trying to save the planet because you're tiny. This is a lesson in humility, which everyone desperately needs, myself included. You probably, not going to speak for him, but probably because we all do, right? We all want to think of ourselves as really important. I want to think that there's a lot of people who really want to hear what I have to say about what Wisecrack has to say about what Dr. Peterson has to say about Catholicism here, which... I maybe shouldn't. Uh, I've been told that some people want to hear what I have to say, and so I'll provide them to, to you guys. Uh, hi, members of my Discord server. But beyond that, right, this is about knowing the scope of our responsibility, our sphere of responsibility. My sphere of, my sphere of responsibility is those, those to whom I have a particular close obligation. So my family, my friends, my students, my uh, my university, and my and to a to a more distant degree, my viewers, you people. Beyond that, I'm not I'm not under any delusion, and I should keep these delusions from as far from my mind as possible that I am going to change the world. Right? That I'm, I I I should not have higher aspirations than I can manage in the here and now. Now, maybe, maybe, say my audience will grow. Or maybe I will gain additional responsibilities, but those build on what's already there. It's not like I jump straight to the goal. Right? It, it, that's not it. You can't do that. That's, that's wildly hubristic to say that. Well, story time. I've, I've told the story in some classes. I think it's in one of my lectures, maybe, that um, that I had a... I had a, uh, a professor of ancient philosophy uh, in my undergraduate when I was a uh, sophomore, second year, 19 years old. And, um, and I have since come to greatly respect her. Um, and, uh, and I've actually told her the story and she found it very funny in retrospect. Um, but uh, it, the first day of class, this, this course was primarily on Plato. And so she said, she told all, all of us that throughout this class, none of us would have a single new thought or new idea about Plato, because everything about Plato, almost everything, has already been thought before, and those things that have not been thought before are either obviously wrong, or are going to take a lot more expertise than any of us, you know, sophomore undergraduates had. I was deeply, deeply offended by this, to the point that I dropped the class, to my great embarrassment in retrospect. Uh, I took the I took the class again a, a later semester, and uh, now I will say she was right. She was one hundred percent right. She was absolutely correct. I did not, in my sophomore year of undergraduate, me nineteen years old, my brilliant, brilliant self. Uh, no, I did not have a new 
thought about Plato. I did not have new ideas that would revolutionize the field. That's ridiculous. I've still not had new ideas that would revolutionize the field. I may, I, I may have a few, a few points about Plato that are, that are a slight derivation from uh, the sort of ordinary scholarly norm, but they're nothing new, new. They're nothing groundbreaking. So no, of course not. To think that I, as a young college student, roughly, was going to completely change even the field, not just not the world, even just the minor, the little field of Plato scholarship, is ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. It is an incredibly inflated self-perception that, uh, that Dr. Peterson's trying to, trying to burst. That our goal should be that which is closest to us, that which we can accomplish, and that which we are called to accomplish. I'm called to the conversion of souls. That means, for me, doing the best I can to educate my students and doing the best I can to, to guide my family and raise my children well in the faith. That's, that's, that's for me. You guys, my viewers, my Ken, thank you for watching. You are very distantly my responsibility. Beyond you, it's not my business. The rest of the world is not my business. <laughs> to it. Now, quick question for everyone watching. You might notice that behind Jordan Peterson, there is a bunch of chopped wood. Please let me know if you think that masculine powerhouse Jordan Peterson chopped that wood himself. Um, you know, maybe our editors could even zoom in on that wood right now. And you can ask yourself if he chopped that wood. But there's I'm actually curious. I don't know. Probably not. Maybe some of it. Maybe. But probably not. He's, he's like in his 60s, right? I wouldn't. Hell, I don't want to be chopping that much wood now. I love when I'm 60-something. Then, what, then again, what the hell do I know? I live in Florida. I don't chop wood. I do, but it's for fun. Hmm. There's a lot going on here, okay? So now we're diving in. He says you got to stop fighting for social justice. He says you got to quit saving the bloody planet. Uh, tend to some souls. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to go a little point by point here. And I want to talk in particular about uh, Catholic social teaching and Catholicism, not just because I was forced into that as a child, but because Peterson himself has said that, quote, I think that Catholicism. Um, I'm 100% sure that you did not learn uh, about Catholic social teaching in your, I don't know, what I assume was going to Catholic school or Sunday school, because that is not taught in like Sunday school and is usually not taught in like Catholic high school, if that's what you did. Like, no, no, that is the kind of thing that you you need to be really curious and look into on your own uh, or you need to be in a sort of professional. You need to be doing theology like you need to be in a like. A theology at least undergraduate program, if not a master's program. Like, no, no. Catholic social teaching is not just something that you pick up in high school. It's ridiculous. Don't lie. That's as sane as people can get. So he mm -hmm. here, here. He's basically saying that Catholicism is the most sane version of faith, of religion. In before he starts talking about the Eucharist. Is he going to do it? Religion of church. And then he's inspired by that to say, stop fighting for social justice, quit saving the planet. But according to... No? Oh, wow. He didn't. He, re he restrained himself from making that joke. I'm, I'm surprised. Good for you. Good for you. To the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, a conference I've never been invited to, a basic moral test. That's not what that means. It's how our most vulnerable members are faring. In a society marred by deepening divisions between rich and poor, our tradition recalls the story of the last judgment and instructs us to put the needs of the poor and vulnerable first. The teachings mm -hmm. of the church itself is saying that taking care of the division between the rich and the poor, fighting for the poor and vulnerable first, is a good thing to do. And they Scroll down. Scroll down to subsidiarity, please. Do I need to pull this up? I could pull this up. You know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it. I'm pulling it up. But here, let's take a look anyway. Here. Let's take a look. Okay. Uh, life and dignity of the human person. So uh, obviously he's skipping this part because that would mean uh, that would mean no abortion to euthanasia, which he has supported in the past. Uh, okay. Family, community, and participation. Uh, this aspect. Okay. Uh, the person is not only really sacred, but also social. How we organize our society and economic and politics in law and policy directly affects human dignity and the capacity of individuals to grow in community. Marriage and family are the central institutions that must be supported and strengthened, not undermined. We believe people have a right and a duty to participate in society, seeking together the common good and well-being of all, especially poor and vulnerable. So, yes, preference, preferential option for the poor is the technical language of this. However, notice where this comes first. Uh, there is, of course, a parallel principle, which I'm actually surprised not to see on this on this page of subsidiarity. Um, but eh, I digress. His point 
They talk about solidarity. As- uh, it does not talk about subsidiarity on this page. Uh, but I will say as well, if he were particularly familiar with Catholic, Catholic social teaching, he would be familiar with solidarity, with uh, subsidiarity as the parallel principles to solidarity, which is the idea that we we must, we always have to get obligation to to take the closest level of responsibility that we have first. That I have a responsibility to what is closest to me and that you have a responsibility to what is closest to you. And together we we form... Uh, we form social unions to bring those concerns sort of into uh, into communion with each other. And that's how subsidiarity and solidarity work together. Without one, the other spins wildly out of control. Okay. So again, here, again, working for the cause of justice means within your proper social role and function. If that is, if you're me, or if you're you, the viewer, or if you're you, Wisecrack, or if you're Dr. Peterson, that means working within the, the the reach that you have, working within the particular conversations and the particular relationships that you have, not trying to influence the entire world at once, because you are not responsible for that. You cannot be responsible for that. Anyway, let's... Step back a second. Between the rich and the poor, fighting for the poor and vulnerable first is a good thing to do. And they talk about yes, preferential option for the poor. Whenever, um, whenever possible, we should uh, we should prefer to to help the most vulnerable and the most in need of help. Uh, again, within that framework of circumstances. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Of course. Solidarity as well. I won't get into the whole thing, but you know, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has solidarity as another one of their big principles, and solidarity with people around the world, solidarity with people struggling from violence and conflict. Now, he also says that we got to quit saving the bloody planet. Well, the the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which again, I've not been invited, if they wanted to invite me. That just means it is the group of of bishops in the United States uh, promulgating doctrine and teaching as a collective unit. That's all that means. I'm sure he knows that, but uh, it would be nice if he would specify that for his audience who almost certainly does not know that. I would attend. So they say, we show our respect for the creator by our stewardship of creation. Care for the earth is not just an Earth Day slogan. It is a requirement of our faith. We are called to protect people on the planet, living our faith in relationship with all of God's creation. This environmental challenge has fundamental moral and ethical dimensions that cannot be ignored. So again. Yeah, so what does that entail? That entails uh, within one's own life, uh, refraining from undue harm to to the environment, to the world around us, etc. Uh, it does not mean the the mere advocacy for worldwide public policies. That's that's radically different. Those are radically different things. Uh, one is actually going to accomplish something, small though it might be. Right? If I uh, if I so today we went for a nature walk. Me and my family went for a nature walk. Uh, we, as they say on the sort of trail signs, we left nothing but footprints, took nothing but memories, right? And some photos. What we didn't do was leave a bunch of trash laying around. Right? What we didn't do was, uh, was, you know, cut down a few trees and take them home and take the wood home or something. No, we respected the environment around us. We, we were intentionally and deliberately non-destructive. And even in the world around us and in other circumstances, we, we, we care for the world that we find ourselves in. I don't find myself in the world in Canada, right? I don't find myself in the world anywhere else than where I am. My locus of responsibility is here, is here, is now. What Dr. Peterson is saying is, is not don't be concerned about the world around us don't be concerned about the environment don't it's none of that it is to stop reaching past what should be your priority and thereby neglecting your priorities what ought to be your your responsibilities because that's what's happening right by by trying to fight for social justice by trying to fight for for environmental justice or what have you uh again even if that's even if it's done well which it probably is not by the way again there's there's ideological contentions here but even setting that aside even assuming that their goals are worthy ones they're not their goals to pursue they're not our goals to pursue at least not mine and at least not most of my students right so to to reach to those further goals, those those goals of, of society-wide or worldwide concern. What that inevitably will mean is they neglect the responsibilities that actually do belong to them. Right? So you might go out and and 
you might want to fight for the, the, the proper treatment of the poor. Good. Is your life in order yet? To put a sharper edge on it in a more you know biblical parable sense, are you stepping over someone? Are you stepping over a poor person in your community in order to fight for the rights of the poor, by which I mean pass legislation, etc.? Or fight for or advocate. Realistically, that's what we mean. We mean advocate for legislation. Because yeah, you probably are. Are you polluting in order to advocate for a cessation to pollution? Probably. People like Greta Thunberg certainly are, right? People at the G20 are, all these, all this, all this sort of thing, right? It is, it is instead of Peterson's point, as I said, is is that instead of uh, trying to do what is beyond ourselves and therefore neglecting what is our own responsibility, we should care for what is our our close responsibility first. And once that's handled, then you can reach further. But you're one person. You're not going to save the world. You can save your part of the world. And if everyone did that in solidarity with one another, then the world would be saved. If everyone converted the souls of the people around us who are our responsibility, the whole world would turn to Christ. But if I go into the far corners of the world where I am not wanted or needed, then the people here back home lose me. And I have some importance here, where I am and where I belong. That's that's what's that's what he's getting at, and that's that's what we're missing here. Big boy Jordan who says that social justice is bad and environmental isn't bad. Well, the church itself says these things are good, it's which we're going to keep this question open, makes me wonder again, is he approaching this tradition with openness? Is he engaging with the theology here? Or is he just trying to find a big, powerful system of belief to graft onto? Who knows? And while This is also, by the way, a topic of serious contention within people who have and have been for their entire lives deeply, uh, deeply committed to and deeply enmeshed within the Catholic tradition. It's, environmental justice is not something which is just simply not debated within the church. Of course it is. Oddly enough, even a writer for the American Conservative, which is a publication I have now read, found Peterson's take on church to be seriously lacking, writing, if some guy mouths okay, off to you at a bar, you can go out in the parking lot and kick his ass. That's what an alpha male would do. And maybe that's the land you're supposed to conquer. Who knows? Either way, it takes guts. But do you know what takes even more guts? Loving your enemy, turning the other cheek, praying for those who persecute you. And he's right. That's, yeah. Like, I don't, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But I don't remember Dr. Peterson ever advocating for going and kicking somebody's ass in a parking lot for mouthing off to you. I don't think that has happened. I might be wrong. But I don't think so. Writing, I think, in direct response to that video. So a, a conservative Christian guy writing for the American conservative found this to be a little bit much. Also, just know that thus far, I've, I've quoted the American conservative, quoted a Catholic writer. You know, I'm not just like saying, oh, Marx wouldn't agree with that. You know, I'm, I'm meaning where he is. Okay, but you know, in fairness, um, our man isn't just recording direct to camera manifestos. Uh, to the church like he's Martin Luther with a YouTube account. He's also put together a crack team of experts to create a full video course on the book of Exodus, which is in the Bible. And now, to be honest, I said this before, I didn't watch the whole thing because A, it's like 30 hours, and B, because it's behind a paywall. So I just want to look. You could have watched the, the biblical lecture series on Genesis. I assume you didn't. Because it was, that one has some legitimate criticisms. There are legitimate criticisms to make, and maybe I'll do a video or two of that at some point. If you're interested, let me know. Throw me some money. Gofi.com slash Professor McCoy. Um, you want to see me pick apart some of uh, some of his um, some of his uh, sort of pagan assumptions that he has in the uh, in the his Exodus videos, his Exodus lectures from from all those years ago, which were great with some problems. Uh, but yeah, no, if you again, you could have looked into those. Although I will, okay, fine. The Exodus ones are more recent, and he is a little bit he's taking the faith a little bit more seriously now. So maybe, but maybe he's. Maybe he has excised some of those issues, I can hope, but if you don't know what the issues were, how can you know that? Look at a little bit of it that was available for free. To get started with, I just want to note that he brings a bunch of professors to the table with him, and I do respect that. We get some, some philosophers, some theologians, but there's one in particular that stood out to me, so let's just watch this for a second. Well, my name is uh, Douglas Headley, and I'm a fellow at the University of Cambridge, a fellow of Clare College, and I teach the philosophy of religion. Do you know where this guy's from? If you pause it right now and let me know if you think you know the connection I'm about to make. We'll settle an argument that has raged for centuries. Which is better, the Bible or the Quran? The Quran. So that one. This guy was on Kunk on Earth. Have you, have you all seen that show? So yeah, now those universes. Why, why is that relevant? Like, even slightly. 
He's a he's a Cambridge philosopher of religion. Of course, Kong on Earth is going to make fun of him, but also, of course, Doctor Peterson is going to want to talk to him about Exodus. Like, what? Okay, whatever. Is have, have officially mixed Ridiculous. the Jordan Peterson universe and the Kunk on Earth universe. Um, so I wanted to give you that as a gift. The part of the manner in which God is portrayed throughout the biblical corpus, but I would say in, in traditions around the world, as that phenomena, phenomenon that that alerts you to your own misbehavior. Okay, so there's some elements to this video, which I actually think are cool. I'm being very serious because you have a table of presumably smart people, including Dennis Prager, who are reading very carefully through a text together and talking about it. And yeah, I love doing that. And that's, I mean, what he said there is, I mean, he's speaking of the function of conscience, uh, which is which has been variably thought of as as part of oneself, but but religiously inspired, um, or simply the voice of Christ or the voice of the Holy Spirit. So yeah, there's there's a lot to say about that. Um, I don't think he's going to say anything about it, but I, I do I do say I do at least give him credit for admiring the format. I don't know. There's a lot of versions of this I would like to see. It's interesting how much Jordan Peterson talks. Because there's other people there who are presumably experts in this stuff. Uh, but he says a thing. Okay, so he's also okay. He's also um, I assume the versions of this he would like to see are are um, historical critical theorists picking it apart because that is again in line with his sort of priors um so yeah again maybe i'm being unfair here but it is a good format it's a great format it's a format that i'd like to emulate for a lot of things by the way i've been thinking about doing a reading uh reading group uh series on boethius consolation of philosophy if you're thinking about likewise let me know and i might be thinking about a good format of doing it in because i'm not totally sold on the way that i've done reading groups in the past anyway something to think about that I think is kind of instructive, so let's watch that right now. And it is really something, again, I really learned from Jung, contra Freud in some real sense, is that, and contra Nietzsche, who believe that maybe we could create our own values, is that there's something within that is transcendent, because it isn't only in you, it's in everyone in some fundamental and real sense, plus it's eternal in some fundamental and real sense, and it calls you on your misbehavior. Okay, so I'll stop there. He says some, some interesting stuff if you want to keep watching, but he describes God as a phenomenon that alerts you to your own misbehavior, and I just, we're going to see this flesh out a little bit more later, but he frames God as sort of like an individual process of conscience or morality, the primary role of which is to let you know um, if you've been naughty or nice. So basically, don't say Santa. Don't say Santa Claus. Don't say Santa Claus. Oh, he's going to say it, isn't he? Please, Santa Claus, except that. <sighs> All right, here it is. Anyway, so um, the, the key difference here, the crucial difference is how this happens. It's not just an internal voice. It's not just a, ooh, you should think about what God will think about this. It's not that. Uh, it's not purely conscience. What Peterson's talking about here, particularly, because I have seen this clip, uh, this this section, is that 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 in in the person of Christ, or or we or we are presented with the person of Christ, because Peterson has a little bit of a a tendency towards the heretical view of the uh, moral exemplar theory of atonement. That what Christ does for us is he provides a perfect example of behavior, a perfect example of, of humanity for us to to follow and aspire to, right? For us to for us to emulate, and so doing so is what is meant by the process of salvation is our emulation of the perfect man in Christ. That's what Peterson is talking about, and so it it is it is the existence of God qua perfection itself serves as a kind of psychological mirror. This is his point that. I mean, it's the it's the what would Jesus do little slogan or bracelet or whatever. Right? It's this it's this presenting. It's this presenting the perfection of God or the perfection of Christ as a standard to which we ought to uh, and we think about measuring ourselves. And it's a large reason why uh, why we Christians in general, Catholics in particular, will, will wear things like icons, uh, will wear religious jewelry, will wear uh, sacramentals. Uh, because it is a sort of reminder to ourselves of what we ought to be, what we ought to be doing, and how we ought to be, how we ought to be, how we ought to be thinking. I, I wear this in part, and I wear it basically all the time, unless I'm sleeping, uh, so I don't, so I don't stab myself. Um, I wear this so that I remember who I ought to be, and who I ought to be emulating. It, it ought to be Christ who lives in me, and that's why, again, it's why I wear the crucifix. <clears throat> is as a reminder of that. And so it is this sort of present the self-presentation of a mirror that is a large part of uh, of the religious aspect of conscience. 
Uh, and again, that's not in any way analogous to Santa Claus, which is just a um, uh, sort of very roughly speaking imaginary imaginary accountability partner. And before you say it, yeah, Santa Claus is yes, I know Santa Claus is real. Santa Claus exists, not as real as as some things, but links in the description anyway. That he can send you to hell if he wants, and. I'm going to flesh this out later, oh, but the way he talks about God makes it sound as if there is a vertical relationship between the individual and, and the divine thing, and the divine thing is like good, bad, good, bad, do this, not that. And while that might sound correct to, to a child in, in Sunday school or something, I, I think that this leads to problems down the road. But we'll... Okay, like, that is partially true. That's just partially correct. It's not incorrect at all. There is a strict vertical relationship between the self, between humans and God. <clears throat> and that... And that God... Um, commands certain things and prohibits certain things again it is purely for the sake of it is purely for the sake of uh of our goodness and our well-being our flourishing right? that god commands in accordance with our natures that he's given us all that but but so there's more there's more to it than that but nothing nothing about that is false anyway we'll cross that bridge when we get to it because compassion, as far as I can tell, that overarching compassion is particularly appropriate when it's directed towards that which is truly helpless. But if it starts to be directed as if towards infants to those who could be competent, then it starts to become destructive. I just want you to note, he called compassion destructive. He said compassion is good when it is directed towards those who are truly helpless, which does seem to be in line with the Catholic social teaching stuff on social justice we talked about before, yeah. but then says we can't be compassionate towards those that are competent. That seems a little bit dangerous. Uh, but let's keep it moving because... Well, he's not going to explain why that's dangerous because that's that's just again straightforward. Um, so his point there again, <clears throat> I feel like I'm just explaining what Peterson has to say here. Just why why is that? I thought he was going to do this. He, I thought he was going to explain what Peterson has to say and why it's a problem. But whatever. No, this is actually this is actually absolutely true that um, that we and again I'll put I'll put it into explicitly Christian terms here for for you for usefulness' sake that 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 God. Okay, grace perfects nature, right? That the grace that we are given by God builds upon our own natural capacities. So grace is in comportment with the nature that it finds. What this means is that grace takes what is there in our in us and builds upon that rather than supplanting, replacing it. What this means is that that God, even God's relationship to us, qua human beings, is conditioned in a sense by our state of being that that we are we are drawn into the divine life and the divine love <clears throat> from where we happen to be right this is a this is a more complex way of saying god meets us where we're at right that, that whole that sort of hippie sounding thing and so for for us us human beings to treat others compassionately and by compassionately here we mean uh we mean with a desire to with a desire to do things for someone let's put it that way and with a maybe we can say with a desire to to try to alleviate pain discomfort hardship etc to to do that is to assume that the other is incapable of dealing with and is incapable of uh, of of suffering and is further incapable of growing from that pain difficulty and hardship because they're incapable of overcoming it now this is different from uh from uh from a desire to a, a desire for someone's good willing the good of another qua love qua charity that is to want what is best for the other person that's different from compassion although these often get conflated compassion in this sense of what he's talking about here is uh, is the desire to to alleviate someone's suffering is to to want to to want to do something to help somebody wanting to do something not not to help somebody in the make them better off sense but to make them more comfortable to make them uh to to make it so they don't have to do something so you can so you you do it for them right? again this can be infantilizing which can be appropriate if you're dealing with an infant or or someone who is in a particular circumstance helpless compassion is just fine if you are saving someone from drowning, right? If you're a lifeguard, you're saving someone from drowning. You need to help them. 
They need your help. They are relying upon you entirely, just like an infant relies on uh, relies on its mother. Right. That that's that's the distinction we can make here. And again, this is not this shouldn't be controversial. But he's but he's he's saying, well, obviously that's problematic. But he doesn't explain why. He he brings up someone who's very important to me um, in the next clip. To me, faith is something like the willingness to take a risk based on a presumption. And maybe the presumption is, well, truth will set you free. It's like, well, tell the truth and see what happens. It's going to get you in a lot of trouble. The evidence that aggregates around you if you tell the truth to the degree that you can isn't that this is going to be the easy path forward. You have to decide. This is something Kierkegaard stressed, right, is that you have to decide certain things as preconditions for action, independent in some real sense of the evidence. And that's the faith. And this is when Abraham, for example, in his great adventure, he goes, he follows God's call out of the safety of the tent. The faith is to heed the call of adventure, even though he's got everything in some sense that you'd need if, you, if you're only interested in hedonistic gratification. But there's something beyond that, and it's faith that allows you to make those decisions to step into the unknown future. So I'm, I'm going to say this. I think what he just said right there, and really clue in, you know, stop doing your other thing. I think that what, what he says there um, isn't wrong. Like this idea that faith is a willingness to take a risk based on a presumption, the way in which faith is connected to decision. I, I think that's really spot on with what Kierkegaard says in a way. So, Kier so yeah, that is, that is Kierkegaardian. I have issues with it. I have issues with it because I have issues with the character guard. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I like that he's I like that he's on board. Let's see if let's see where he thinks he goes awry. Character guard, in case you haven't heard me talk about this before, um, his whole deal was that faith can't be a matter of the intellect, right? We don't have faith in something because we're logically convinced. Uh, we don't have faith in something because we're born in true into a tradition. Faith is a matter of making an existential decision, making a leap of faith, and not knowing how it's going to work out. This is why Kierkegaard is sort of the forefather of existentialism, because he's saying there's no magical, objective essence to this thing. You have to have faith to believe in the thing. And this is why I thought there was a logical paradox at the heart of Christianity. Uh, okay, so this is actually a little bit of where I... This is where I part ways and disagree with Kierkegaard because um, Kierkegaard goes goes so far in what is it? Truth is subjectivity, I think, is the essay, um, where he says that um, that not only is reason, logic, and evidence not useful for faith, but that it can be inimical, inimical to faith. It can prevent one from having the virtue of faith. If you know something to be true, the implication goes you can't have faith in that. And so he, Kierkegaard will say that, that well, first of all, he thinks that, that, that knowledge of the divine is, is per se impossible. He's, he's a, he's a um, um, via negativa, what's it called? Uh, uh, forget the English. <laughs> um, apathetic, apathetic, apathetic theologian. I think is the term, which isn't English either, but sorry. Uh, he basically, he thinks that knowledge of God is impossible. We can only know what God is not, if even that. Uh, and so so he doesn't think that knowledge of God and knowledge of what the faith would provide is possible. Um, but, and this is contrary to not just the, the long Catholic tradition, but it's also contrary to, to established and infallible Catholic dog, uh, dogma uh, that the existence of God can be demonstrated through reason alone. Uh, and that there are pre there are preambles of faith, such as God's existence, that can be demonstrated through reason alone. Uh, not that they necessarily need to be to have faith, but that faith, on the the sort of Catholic tradition, is uh, is trust in what one has good reason to believe. Right? So it does start with reason. Kierkegaard thought that that faith has to be by its very nature absent reason or maybe even contrary to reason, uh, depends on where he's talking about it, that if you have uh, a rational basis for a belief, then it, it can't be faith, and you cannot have the virtue of faith there, because you can't make a leap of faith if there's a bridge, so to speak. And so again, I, I don't agree with, I don't agree with Kierkegaard there. Uh, I think that, I think that he's way off base, and I think that thinking in that way uh, is what can lead you to this sort of thing. Uh, of assuming that uh, intellectualism and Christianity are at odds. So, anyway. Um, and so, I I'm both interested by the fact that he brings up Kierkegaard here, but I'm also a little bit confused because in other points, and we'll look to this later, Peterson speaks with, I don't know if like hubris is the right word, but he leans into objectivity when talking about faith. He leads into like certain, certain logical certainties, which is the opposite of what Kierkegaard was doing. So Kierkegaard's whole thing was that- Okay, so I would, I would say that that Dr. Peterson does fall into hubris at times, but not because he thinks that faith is a matter of objectivity, but more so that it, that he that he he thinks that he can't achieve it, which is an odd kind of hubris. 
it, it looks like intellectual humility, but rather, but 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 it's it's more like the kind of hubris that that Pascal criticizes, where where the the intellectually hubristic, typically scholar, wants to say that um, that my knowledge is all that there is and all that matters. That that in order for me to believe something, I have to be able to figure it out and determine it to be true uh, entirely uh, entirely through my own reason. So I have to be able to figure it out. I cannot rely upon testimony. I cannot rely upon other other thinkers, other scholarship, other other uh, other sources of knowledge apart from my own reason. That's the kind of hubris that I think Dr. Peterson falls into, or is prone to falling into, or has fallen into in the past, at least. Uh, I wouldn't say that he's hubristic insofar as he thinks that 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 propositions about God are objective. That's yeah, fine. That's contrary to Kierkegaard, but. We maybe should contradict Kierkegaard here and there. During his era, churches and people that were Christians evacuated everything of faith because it was just a matter of logical propositions and the church was connected with society. And I'm a Lutheran because I'm born in Denmark at this time, but no one's relating to their individual faith in, in a passionate way. Um, and I don't really see so much of that in the other stuff that he's saying, but wanted to bring that up. And, you know, he later goes on to say that the truth. So the practical, no, no, I will say the, the practicality aspect of it is, again, also something that, that Peterson can fall into. And that is also re, really Pascalian. Right? Pascal uh, advocated for that sort of thing, that, that, that relying upon uh, social convention is one way of making that impossible choice to just you know, decide to believe. And then, then eventually your belief will become genuine. You'll, you'll be granted that gift of faith. Um, but this... Yeah, this is, a, I will say, a, a fault that maybe Peterson doesn't fall into too much, but a lot of his a lot of his followers will. Uh, a lot of them will say that, well, I think we should we should rebuild a Christian society, even though I don't think it's true. Um, Sargon of Akkad is a great example of this. Uh, Carl Benjamin, uh, he he holds that uh, that Christianity is false. He's still an atheist, at least he, at least mostly, uh, I think, um, last I've known. But he also thinks that we do kind of need a Christian society. So he thinks that it's that it's practically useful to believe in Christianity, um, even though he thinks it's false, which, again, is is is. It's an easy trap to fall into once you get into this pragmatic mode of consideration that, that I think Peterson drifts into. Is an adventure another thing I think that Kierkegaard and a lot of philosophers would agree with. And in the sense, he's sort of at least flirting with the idea that there's something existential in terms of how faith affects our subjectivity. And I had to say that because I just don't want to be accused of, of piling on and shitting on the guy, you know, even, even a broken clock, even a broken clock. Um, there's one more clip I want to watch from this, and it is, it's a very long video, it's two hours and 20 minutes. You know, I guess it's, it's no killers of the flower moon. I was looking at the Sermon on the Mount the other day, and Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount that those who are poor in spirit are blessed. There's many people who are blessed, but the poor in spirit are blessed. And the question is, what does that mean? And it means something like those who have been brought low enough to be humble enough to be ready to receive, to be ready to receive, to be ready to receive. And yeah. I think that's what's being echoed here. Yes. OK, he's mad about this. And I know why he's mad about this, because his basis in Christianity is not fundamentally Catholic. It is fundamentally. Should I say Calvinist? Should I say Calvinist? He's going to accuse this of of a kind of semi-Pelagianism. That's my assumption because because this is supposed to, this seems like it 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 it, it can come off as uh, the idea that we are ourselves contributing something to uh, to the to uh, to the miraculous gift of faith. In other words, we're contributing our particular state of being, state of mind, new consciousness of being ready. We have to ready ourselves to receive faith, and that is probably going to be taken to be uh, a kind of. Um, uh, contrary to uh, to sola fide, or contrary to um, uh, sola dei gloria, um, is, is it dei? Or, well, glory to God alone. Uh, it's going to be contrary to tulip in some way, and he's going to be all grumpy about that. I'm assuming that he's going to accuse this of maybe not in so many words because I don't know if he knows the word Pelagian, uh, but this is that he's going to say this sounds to semi Pelagian in some way. But it, again, it doesn't. This is very straightforward doctrine error, even. Uh, really mild um, Catholic Catholic doctrine. Or is that that's part of the reflection of that's Moses' the best nakedness? Explanation I ever heard. Dennis Prager, by the way, it's the Prager you guy. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. It took me only forty years to think about. <laughs> that's a little odd that 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 a a that we get that as a uh, a, a Jewish response. Whatever. I, I I don't know what to make of that, but 
Prager's an odd duck when it comes to theology. He's he's very Jewish sometimes, and he's he's very Judeo Christian other times. So it's hard to say. That that really helps because hmm. um, I've never thought. Oh, the, the poor are so special. They're yeah, wonderful no, it's the, poor, no, it's lousy poor. No, and... it's definitely a reference to pride. Okay, so a couple things there. Um, yes. One, you'll notice right off the bat that Peterson is quick to read that quote from Sermon on the Mount, where, where Jesus says, "Like blessed are the poor." Um, in spirit, he actually says, "Poor in spirit." Don't don't put don't take words out of Christ's mouth. What is wrong with you? As being poor in spirit, and poor in spirit being a process of humility that makes one ready to receive or deserve something else. Then it goes to death. Yes, he, he literally says that. Like, that's literally what Christ says. He says poor in spirit. He doesn't say blessed are the poor. Not there. He says blessed are the poor, not in so many words, but he does say elsewhere that the poor, uh, the poor will inherit the kingdom of God because the rich have received their reward, that sort of thing. Which again has to do with what we what we what we keep to ourselves versus what we give up, right? What we give up, we give to the kingdom. We give for the sake of the kingdom of God, and we will we we uh, we we have not received that as a reward, uh, and so uh, it's it's a it's a it's a sort of um, um, commutative justice, right? Uh, in Thomistic terms, I guess. Uh, but no, it's no no no. The Sermon on the Mount, the the Beatitudes, it's, it's poor in spirit. It is blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a, Stop taking words out of Christ's mouth. Dennis Prager, the guy that runs Prager U, um, a wonderful online educational resource that's now allowed in many public schools in America. And he's like, yeah, okay, fine. I mean, a lot of it is a phenomenal educational resource. Some of it is, some of it's questionable, but a lot of it is, a lot of it's very straightforward. Yeah, I always wondered like, why are, why are the poor good? There's lousy poor, whatever. And they quickly, that's true. Like the... people who don't have a lot of wealth can be, I have to be careful saying this, how, to, how I say this exactly. They can be just as vicious as anyone else. They can have just as much vice as anybody else. But there are impediments to virtue that are not present for the poor, that are present for the rich. But the opposite is true to some extent as well, right? There are impediments to virtue that are present uniquely for the poor. Um, the, things like uh, a severe temptation to to uh, to employ unjust means of survival, for instance. That's that's. Uh, it, let me put it this way: If you don't have a lot of resources, you're far more prone to getting yourself into unwinnable uh, moral dilemmas. In which case, you're you are uh, you're in a moral quandary. You're in perplexes. But at the same time. You don't have the the same impetus to typically to hubris. You don't have the same impetus to uh, to disdain, uh, to like, dismissal of other people for their social status, that sort of thing. Uh, it can lead to uh, a kind of poverty of spirit. It can lead to a kind of meekness as well. Um, but it doesn't need to. That's the whole point: is that it doesn't need to lead to uh, to you know virtue to the development of virtue. You can develop into a into a perfectly awful, not perfectly, but you know, you know what I mean. A very awful person, regardless of your social status. It might be easier to do that if you have more resources available to you. It is easier to go wrong if you have more available to you. That's all. Evacuate any social meaning of that idea and make the poorness about a certain type of humility. It's just a wild reason. That is the, oh my god. That's literally what the text means. That is what the text, that's not even what the text means. It's what the text says. That part, that's what that part means. Now, fine, there is social meaning to other things that Christ says, which is in line with what you're trying to push here, what you're trying to say, which is that we should care for the poor, that the poor are, uh, have unique blessings, and uh, that, that, that we should, in uh, at least, we should be cautious of, uh, of excess accumulation of wealth, all these sorts of things. Great. All of these have social implications to them, but not this part. I don't know what you, why you're obsessing over this. You're, you're, you're wildly misreading something. Reading And what it makes me think of is a whole tradition uh, in Christianity, Catholicism in particular, um, you know, that's called liberation theology. And this is basically a bunch of largely Latin American priests who, you know, study theology in Europe and they, they come back to Latin America and stuff not going so well, largely because of stuff that, that America did. Um, you mean Marxism? in concert with Reagan. We haven't referenced Reagan a lot recently, so Reagan did this. But one of the most famous...
liberation theology took off before Reagan took office. What are you talking about? Members of that movement is Gustavo Gutierrez. And now this is how Gutierrez describes some of his work relative to how you know, Christians are meant to treat the poor. He said, Christians have not done enough in this area of converting to the neighbor, to social justice, to history. They have not perceived clearly enough yet that to know God is to do justice. They have yet to tread the path that will lead them to seek effectively the peace of the Lord and the heart of social struggle. And I'm only bringing- Liberation theology is quite literally, quite literally, historically speaking, a Soviet infiltration. Like, liberation theology is specifically, was specifically brought into the Latin American church by KGB agents. First of all. Second of all, though, I need to go back because I've been interrupting too much because I've been utterly shocked by his comparison of what Peterson was saying to liberation theology. Oh my gosh. All right, let's, let's, let's see. Let's take this back a few minutes. Again, I apologize. I know this is a really long video and it's already been well over an hour, but... We got to do this, man. Whole tradition uh, in Christianity, Catholicism in particular, right, reading and meaning of that idea Let's and see. make the poorness about a certain type of humility. It's just a wild reading. And what it makes you think of is a whole tradition. Uh, oh, okay. It makes him think of liberation theology. Okay. 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 Fine. Fine. Um, liberation theology is wrong and dangerously wrong, but. Okay, come, let's continue. In Christianity, Catholicism in particular, um, you know, it's called liberation theology. And this is basically a bunch of largely Latin American priests who, you know, study theology in Europe. And they, they it is, uh, okay, so liberation theology is at its most fundamental, um, a kind of uh, collectivization of salvation. It is about the, the salvation of society as such rather than, this, rather than the salvation of uh, the individual who gives his life uh, to Christ. Uh, it is a, it is an apotheosizing of the uh it's an apotheosizing of the uh, of social teaching to be about salvation rather than being about uh rather than being about uh, uh care for a fellow man and then also an imminent an imminentization of the eschaton it is a uh, it is a uh a, a an impetus to to manifest uh the kingdom of god in the world as we see it today uh, both of which are are, are dangerous doctrines uh, and then it, it results in all of, the, all of what he's talking about here. They come back to Latin America and stuff's not going so well, largely because of stuff that, that America did um, in concert with Reagan. We haven't referenced Re Again, that's just nonsense. Again, this was this, uh, this, okay. A lot of the problems in Latin America had to do with uh, the influence of the U.S., but before Reagan, and primarily because uh, Latin America was a serious front in the Cold War. And by front, I mean, it was where a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, political and uh, and espionage contests were happening between the CIA and the KGB. However, most notably, most of most of the nations in Latin America tended to go uh, far more communistic than capitalistic in their uh, in their systems of governance uh, until uh, until, well, until Argentina recently. Viva <laughs> Uh Anyway, but no, uh, other than that, like it's uh, Anyway, moving on. Reagan a lot recently, so Reagan did this. But one of the most famous members of that movement is Gustavo Gutierrez. And this is how Gutierrez describes some of his work relative to how, you know, Christians are meant to treat the poor. He said, Christians have not done enough in this area of converting to the neighbor, to social justice, to history. They have not perceived clearly enough yet that to know God is to do justice. They have yet to tread the path that will lead them to seek effectively the peace of the Lord and the heart of social struggle. And I'm only bringing that up to say that there is an entire tradition um, within Christian theology that connects things like the Sermon on the Mount to the necessity to privilege and take care of the poor and the downtrodden. Okay, last video. I mean, Catholic social teaching says all of that, but the connection to the Sermon on the Mount is absurd, um, which, I mean, yes, fine, liberation theology does this, but that is an absurd connection that is, that is incredibly tenuous, and it is reading wildly into the text. It's reading, uh, it's reading a lot of very political priors, so when they say uh, we're educated in Europe and went to Latin America, what they mean is they were given essentially Marxist education and were and were sent to Latin America, uh, largely to disrupt the church. Again, this is this is this is all historically well documented. None of this is none of this is made up. None of this is. Feel free to check this. Uh, this is one called oh "Why Should You Go to Church?" And in the video, he's talking about what we will lose as a society if we're not going to church, if we're not you know activating our faith. Uh, I just want to note this is on his YouTube channel.
Wait, did he just like drop the liberation theology point? What is the what is the connection? Is it just that liberation theologians say that there is a connection between the Sermon on the Mount and care for the poor? Is that it? Like, I really thought he was going to go into more of this, but okay, whatever. If that's all, then I spent more time on it than he did. And the first hashtag in the description is hashtag what is a woman? And the second hashtag is Catholicism. Uh, so let's watch. It, he works for the Daily Wire. This is from right after What is a Woman came out. The movie came out. So. Anyway, I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but that's 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 uh, that's just, uh, you know, cross advertising. Watch our first look from this. You're going to get rid of that, eh? You're going to get rid of marriage. You're going to get rid of funerals. You're going to get rid of Christmas. You're going to get rid of any oh, sense of sacred time. Show. You're going to dispense with the whole history of what Judeo-Christian thought. Yeah, so uh, again, I'll put a link in the description to my video about dispensing with sacred time, which was heavily inspired by uh, by Jonathan Peugeot and some of his thoughts. And uh, where I bring up the idea, the point that our society, our modern sort of secular Western society has no liturgical, has no liturgy, has no sacred time. Uh, and so, yeah, we have something like holidays, but they don't actually guide our lives in any real significant sense. And the way that, and insofar as they do, they do so in an inverted sort of backwards and self-destructive way. Um, I point there to, um, to uh, the, the, the sort of occasion for this video was Mardi Gras. Uh, which I, and I recorded on, on Ash Wednesday, funny enough, um, in 2020, actually. So it was almost exactly four years ago. Uh, and this was when, um, this was when I had noted, I had noticed that, uh, that Universal Studios, the, the theme park, uh, starts their Mardi Gras celebration on Fat Tuesday, on Mardi Gras, and it extends all the way through Lent and into Easter. And so what we have is just a, a very precise, very precise inversion of liturgical time, uh, which we, which I've argued there, we, we do the exact same thing with every holiday, except the ones we should do. Okay, so every other holiday we do, we have a massive lead time, then the holiday happens, and then we stop it immediately. Think about Christmas. Uh, the, the celebration of Christmas gets earlier and earlier and earlier every year, it seems like. Uh, certainly, it like the celebration of Christmas typically starts, uh, what, right after Thanksgiving, maybe right after Halloween. Uh, but what you'll know about the liturgical calendar is that that's Advent, right? December is Advent. Christmas starts on December 25th and goes through either the Epiphany, if you're really, really, really liberal and modern, or Candlemas, which is uh, February 2nd, 2nd or 7th, can't remember, February, a month and a half. Or if you're, if you're really intense, like I tend to be, goes through Mardi Gras. Right? It goes until Lent. Christmas starts on Christmas Day and goes forward. We treat Christmas, we treat Advent like it's Christmas. And then we treat Christmas, because we're burnt out on Christmas, when it's actually Christmas season, we just get seasonal depression. Again, that's the importance. There is a, there's a, there's a huge significance, a huge importance to sacred time, uh, which is this, this cyclical, cyclical pattern of feasting and fasting, of celebration and of solemnity that we as a society don't do right. We celebrate until we get burnt out and then we just go <laughs> until it's time to celebrate again and then we go crazy. And we don't have time that is set aside and dedicated to solemnity, to quietude. We don't have penitential seasons in our society anymore. And it's a huge problem. Um, so yeah, uh, and Peugeot's talked about this as well. Um, I, I, I like that they're talking about it here. Anyway, let's see what he has to say about this. I'm sure it's going to be inane. You're going to dispense with the idea of the sacred nature of the individual? Like, how far are you willing to go with this? Yeah, and too. believe me, that question is right in front of you. Because there's a wave of radicals who are asking you at every moment, what makes you so sure that there's a difference between a man and a woman? Okay, so there it is. I, I think we got it. I think we got it. Um, Jordan Peterson, at the end of the day, this whole edifice around why faith is important, why church is important, why he loves Catholicism so much, is that he only, he wants there to be to be men and, and women and he doesn't want any other uh, categories or anything. He thinks that a wave of radicals wants to ask questions about that. Um, I mean, well, yes, um, but also, okay. Um, it's easy to see that if you're being uncharitable, but also it, there's a very, very similar interpretation uh, that is that is far more charitable and far more serious. It's that Peterson noticed that the world is going mad, that the clown world is happening, 
because again, the first major conversation that that Peterson and Peugeot had was uh, the metaphysics of of Pepe of Pepe the Frog, the, the meme face. Um, the and so it, it was precisely about the sort of inversion of our of our um, social dynamics, I, I guess you'd say, uh, and the the. the absurdity of our conception of the world, right? And so that actually ties in really well with, with questions like what is a woman and our, uh, our sort of societal gender confusion, things like that, right? Our, our blurring of categories, which is a huge thing that Peugeot talks about a lot of the, of, is the blurring and uh, uh, the blurring of categories, the elimination of distinction, uh, the inversion of margin and center, that sort of thing, right? So, Given all of that, given those observations, given that observational data, if we want to put it in sort of scientific or clinical terms, Peterson noticed that the world is flipping upside down, that these distinctions are being blurred for some reason. And he seeks an explanation because that's what a scientist does. You seek an explanatory mechanism for, for observed phenomena, especially strange observed phenomena. And so one explanatory mechanism is found within Christianity, right? What we find is an explanatory mechanism for well, this is what happens when we have when we abandon these prior first principles, that the world becomes uh, the, our understanding of the world gets confused, and we're we're incapable of making uh, careful distinctions be between things uh, because of uh, because of the the abandonment of these these fundamental principles because of uh, excuse me um, uh, ideological uh, ideological motivations etc right all that. <clears throat> And so rather than saying, I want, which, I mean, his accusation here is basically that I have this political ax to grind, which I guess it would be, I mean, call gender theory or opposition to gender theory political if you really have to. But again, it's more like uh, a metaphysical presupposition, a metaphysical, not presupposition, supposition, metaphysical conclusion. He's got this metaphysical ax to grind, let's say. And so... Weisskrack's argument is that he's got this axe to grind, and so he he it, he appropriates Christian language and uh, and Christian scholarship even in order, or sorry, in service to what he wants to talk about. Rather, now we could just say that he has he is discovering the importance of Christianity independently of all this, and there are relationships between these ideas, and he's discovering those relationships. But maybe maybe if we want to say that there's a there's sort of a, a, a causal mechanism between the two. A much more plausible causal mechanism is he noticed something strange. He noticed our problem with with uh, distinctions and, and definitions and things, and said, "Why is that?" And found an explanatory mechanism in Christianity, and so and so starts to explore: is there something serious here? And then finds something profound and serious about it after having explored it because of this 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 further downstream idea of uh, in this case, what is a woman? In this case, you know, gender theory. That's far more plausible and and far more charitable and far more serious uh, of an explanation than, well, he's just appropriating Christianity for the sake of talking about gender theory. He's just saying it right there, and I do think this deflates. He's not just saying this is this is another one of those things where he's not listening to what's being said. I don't know some of the intensity or some of the even supposed earnestness around his engagement with this stuff, and there's other clips where this happens too that I left out as well. Where again, he's just assuming here that Peterson's interest is disingenuous, which there's no reason to suppose that, aside from disliking him, which I think that's it. That's the only motivation here, really. He'll leave this long circle just to come back to like, what is a woman? And there's a lot of uh, theologians and biblical scholars who have written about gender and you know uh, queer theory and trans issues in relationship to this stuff. You can check that out if you want. But I just think he's kind of telling on himself there and it makes you take every- Most of whom are, are uh, most of whom are explicitly heretical. Uh, materially, if not formally, and a lot of them are formally her heretical. Um, and also, I'm told that he's going to get back to talking about Pope Francis and his views on gender theory. So I can't wait for that, because actually, there's a there's a there's a forget if it's an encyclical or just a document from the Congregation for the Do uh, for the Doctrine of the Faith about primarily at least about gender theory. It's coming up soon. It's coming out next month, I think cannot wait next month again as of this recording um when it comes out i'll uh if i remember to i'll put a link to the document in the description so if you watch this later on it might just be there to look at to check out everything he's saying a lot less seriously and again he wants to use of course you, you know christianity what he says. as a guise for a type of, of you, you know social exclusion 
which personally, you know. Uh, again, I, this is the this is the very Marxian assumption that that any distinction, any principal distinction that we make is simply exclusionary, which it is in a sense, but that it is uh, that any kind of uh, distinction that we make is fundamentally unjustified. And so therefore any any exclusion that we do is uh, is fundamentally malicious, which again, it isn't keeping again, I can't believe I have to say this, but it is current year. So keeping men out of the women's changing room is unjustified exclusion, apparently. To quote Chief Keith. And it's actually the, the mysterious part of it that has to be re Again, he's just giving, he's, he's, he's telling on himself here that he simply does not like Peterson's conclusions. And so is reading into his motivations. Taint, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the crucifixion, all of that crazy mythology, let's say, because otherwise it de just degenerates into another form of cheap social justice. And like, don't we have enough of that? So the point here, again, is that tradition, mythology, the virgin birth, all the, the big Catholic things are so important because if we don't have those, it all devolves into a cheap version of social justice. It... Okay, there's no way. There's no way he's... There's no way he has that little reading comprehension. Or I guess listening comprehension, but whatever. Same thing. Peterson is saying here that it is the... He's basically saying contrary to... He's saying something contrary to this criticism that I was... I myself was leveling at Peterson earlier in this video, for which I apologize. I have not seen this clip, or at least it never, it didn't come to mind. I thought I saw this interview. Whatever, it didn't come to mind. But it's saying here that the Jefferson's Bible version of Christianity, the part with, with all of the supernaturalism extracted away, extracted out from it, that ignores all of that part, is simply reducible to just another political ideology. Which, yeah. Yeah, like without the, the miraculous aspects, without the supernatural aspects, without the theological aspects of Christianity, it is entirely worthless. Like there is no reason to, uh, there's no reason to to adhere to it, right? If, if oh God, what is it? St. Paul said, um, if, if, if he was not crucified, then, uh, then I, then this, this wisdom is but foolishness or something like that. I, again, I can't remember the exact quote, but I'm not a, I'm not a Protestant. I can't prove text too well. I apologize. Um, I think they've got on us. But, uh, but man, that is... I want to go back a second to see exactly what his response to this is going to be in full. I'm going to let him go. Give him enough rope to, rope to hang himself here. Because he if, if he's misinterpreting this this badly, as bad as it looks like... So... The point here, again, is that tradition, mythology, the virgin birth, all the, the big Catholic things are so important because if we don't have those, it all devolves into a cheap version of social justice, which seems to be showing again that he has no idea that social justice is inherently linked to that tradition and many theological traditions. But more importantly, it shows that, in my humble opinion, all he's doing here, and this is what he did, you know, when he talked about postmodernism, right? Said all this stuff, uh, you know, misquote some philosophers, and at the end of the day, it's just to say, and that's why pronouns are bad. That's why social justice is bad, whatever it might be. He discounts, you know, Marx and talks about biology just to say that, like, you know, gender norms are, are good and social justice is bad and yada, yada. And he's doing the same thing here, right? He has a pattern. He takes a school of thought. He's doing the opposite. With postmodernism and Marxism, it sort of lets make these into bad things to make sure that we're not getting social justice. And here, it's sort of like, let's make traditional Christianity a positive thing. Let's glob my thought onto that to have another fight against social justice. But I think it's ki kind of stupid because a lot of the things he's against are inherent in the very tradition. But, uh, you know. That's literally the opposite of what he's doing. He is saying fundamentally that Christianity is more than a political ideology. And that the more than part is the important part. That is the essence of Christianity. And that the political uh, aspects that follow from all of that, say, are there but they're not the essence of it. They are, they are, they're ancillary. They, they follow from the core, the core principles and tenets and doctrines. How is he getting this so literally and completely backwards? This is, this is, this is almost, almost shocking. Like, it's not just that he's getting it wrong. He's, he's completely inverting what Jordan Peterson is saying. He's he's um he's Kathy Newmaning. He's doing the the whole so you're saying thing. 
Oh my god. Oh, priests and theologians, get in the comments and let us know. Okay, so that's that's all the clips we're watching. I promise, that's all. But I couldn't get through this whole video without checking out the tweets of one of the most prolific posters in the game, um, especially because oh, last year here we go. Um, okay. Peterson opened up the Twitter app and it was still Twitter then to teach the Pope about Christianity. So let's let's end by looking at, at Twitter really quick oh, and then we'll get out of here. Pope Francis tweeted this. Okay, this is going to be fun uh, because Dr. Peterson is unhinged on Twitter. So I, I can fully admit that. Like some of his, even some of his, uh, like especially some of his recent stuff. Like, man. All right, let's see. Let's Social see justice gets. demands that we fight against the causes of poverty, inequality, and the lack of labor, land, and lodging, against those who deny social and labor rights, and against the culture that leads to taking away the dignity of others. And this is the sort of okay. you know tweet that those of us who grew up Catholic and then straight a little bit are like, okay, that's pretty cool. Peterson jumps in and says, there are wait, 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 before we get to Peterson's reply, like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. This sounds like... So this is the kind of thing... Let's keep this in mind. This is the kind of thing that is... I don't want to see it sound too negative about this because there's nothing in here that's objectionable in and of itself. The terminology is wacky, but only in English because of the English association with it. But, no, but the social justice, the social justice thing. Um, again, just because of the, the terminological uh, associations in the English language with that term. But anyway, that aside, um, this is the kind of thing which is inoffensive to the world and by the world i mean this in the technical gospel sense the world as opposed to god as opposed to the church this is uh this is appealing to those who are in sort of fundamental opposition to the church and if and again if he's not in fundamental opposition to the church i don't know who is so all right let's see there is nothing Christian about social justice. Redemptive salvation is a matter of the individual soul. Okay, that's, again, also true. The difference is the use of the term social justice. Right? There is nothing Christian about social justice as it is, under, as it is understood by sort of Anglo-American leftists. Right? But social justice, as a technical term within Catholicism, is a technical term used in conjunct, in conjunct with uh, Catholic social teaching, uh, the idea that justice is a matter of uh, of uh, the the structure and organization of society, and that 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 there there are right and wrong aspects of that, and that there can be individuals morally responsible for that, in some cases at least. Again, the the sort of Anglo-American leftist definition of social justice is more like the um attributing attributing the good to social causes and the good is taken here to be universal and so what peterson is criticizing here is the notion that that social justice in this sort of anglo-american definition as the, the sort of fundamental basis for all uh for all good things and that all bad things are for from social injustice in this sense of sort of collective societies uh that the collectively imposed uh, unjust systems or something like that that this is uh, that this is fundamentally non-christian and that's that's true right because salvation does not have to do with uh with society right it does not have to do with social institutions except insofar as those institutions are conducive to or contrary to uh the the salvation of souls which is an individual sacramental thing and i think the pope knows that and by i think i mean he does know that Go ahead. It was a bad impression, but it is what it was. But like, again, I don't want to impression. go down this road too much. You can look all this sort of stuff up, um, but there are so many direct critiques of capitalism by the Catholic Church, you know, and by... Uh, okay, I'm not going to get into this too much now, but I'll just put a link to Tom Wood's book, The Church and the Market. Um, great book. Um, but uh, but it, it depends on what we mean by capitalism here. If by capitalism we were defining it the way Marx defined it, yeah, sure, yeah, you can criticize that to the, to the bank. Uh, but if by capitalism you mean uh, you mean uh, something like the social arrangement by which there is no legal means of initiating force, again, you can you can criticize that from a Catholic perspective, but but not through ordinary sort of the 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 social teaching encyclicals. Yeah, you really can't do that. Um, maybe you can use the um, Pope Francis' statements about unfettered capitalism. 
right? The idea that unfettered capitalism is to be to be decried. But again, the question is, what are the fetters? Um, and if the fetters are uh, are uh, sort of um, moral um, moral norms, then yeah, absolutely, you can't like un capitalism, which is not constrained by the moral norms of those who participate within it, is going to devolve into to enemy, um, devolve into you know social chaos. Uh, and, ex and mutual exploitation and all sorts of things, just like any other system will. And so we require the, the sort of moral knowledge and guidance of the church. But that isn't to say that capitalism needs to be sort of fettered or constrained by, by you know, state regulation. That again, stark distinction, brief version of this. I've talked about this for hours and hours and hours with countless people. I don't want to get into it too deeply here, but, but all right by, you know, popes and stuff themselves. You know, Pope Benedict, who's one of the bad ones. You know, he said capitalism encourages... Oh, yeah, that's right. He's evil. Right. Okay. Another... Oh, I mean, Wisecrack is evil, so he thinks... He calls he calls good evil and evil good. Okay. Selfishness as men are concerned exclusively with what they should receive from society and unconcerned with what they can or should contribute to it. Almost like... Again, if that's, if that's what you mean by capitalism, fair. Again, that's taking a roughly Marxian definition of capitalism. And men just think they're supposed to grab a wife um, and take over society or whatever, you know? Um, you know, Pope Francis said, it is vital that government leaders and financial leaders take heed and broaden their horizons, working to ensure that all citizens have dignified work, education, and health care. How do we accomplish that? Again, the best way of accomplishing that, empirically speaking, is, uh, and ethically speaking, but mostly empirically speaking, is through through robust free market exchange. Current Pope has critiqued trickle-down economics, all this sort of stuff. The only No one defends trickle-down economics. Point here is that, you know, to see Jordan Peterson come at the Pope and, like, tell him how to do his job feels ridiculous but again it's also missing out that there's an inherent move for quote-unquote social justice if by that we mean a critique of capitalism um an emphasis on justice for the oppressed and the downtrodden and those sorts of things okay so if by social justice we mean a critique of capitalism and what was this precise justice, phrasing by that we mean a critique of capitalism um an emphasis on justice for the oppressed and the downtrodden and those sorts of things okay justice for the oppressed and the downtrodden Again, it might depend on what you mean by justice here. If you mean uh, if you mean something like equity, then yeah, that's a problem. And Peterson talks about the problem of equity a whole lot. Um, but again, if that's what you mean, if it's a critique of capitalism, that has nothing to do with Catholicism. Um, again, Catholics have critiqued versions of capitalism. Fine. Um, but again, it depends on what you mean by each of those things. Uh, and same with justice for the oppressed. It depends on kind of what you mean by that. If by that you mean that uh, the oppressed ought to uh, ought to uh, that we ought to prefer and defer to aiding the oppressed when possible. We should, yes, absolutely, and that we ought not to oppress those who are uh, those are who are experiencing hardship. That as well. But if by that you mean that we should have uh, blanket social equity, again, that has nothing to do with Catholicism. In fact, it's inimical to the faith. It's all over the thing. So again, it just shows that that. He has an agenda. I think it's clear what the agenda is. Um, but yeah, so let's let's wrap up there. Later that day. Okay, actually, oh, let's look, not wrap more. up there. Um, it's Michael from the future in my home. I had to drop in because since we filmed this video, the Pope kind of screwed me. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Right after we filmed this, an article came out that the Pope talked about how gender theory is an ugly ideology that threatens humanity, which makes him sound um, kind of like Peterson, which bummed me out. And then it got even worse when I started oh, poking around and realized thought? that he's been saying this stuff for a while. So I had to throw... A while? Like since before he was Pope? Um, his first, uh, his first encyclical, Amoris Laetitia, uh, which gets a nasty reputation for a lot of things among sort of tradition, really traditional Catholics, um, because it says some things that are, that, that can be taken to, uh, that can be taken, that can be easily misinterpreted, let's say, to, uh, to condone, uh, adultery, qua divorce and remarriage, uh, or at least to accept it. Now, um, that also... Morris Laetitia uh, denies, like flatly denies, gender theory, and denies that gender and sex are uh, are separable. It says something very closely along the lines that uh, that gender and sex are conceptually distinct, but never uh, but never separable in fact. Right? They, they name different things, but they perfectly correspond. In other words, that gender supervenes upon sex. Again, all of this goes back to the entire history of Francis Pontificate, and then some. Right, Amoris Laetitia was was a document that he was working on in conjunction with uh, with uh, Pope Benedict XVI before uh, before Pope Francis even became Pope. So again, this is this shouldn't. First of all, yeah, anyone who's been paying any attention knows this. Second of all, it should be it should be the least surprising thing ever, because Pope Francis is not some 
uh, some like leftist hippie that the leftist hippies and the crazy right wing rad trads the set of acantus want him to be. No, he's the pope. Like the pope is Catholic. Newsflash. Goes in there to a say that honestly the pope is saying things that are more aligned with some of the things that Pearson's talking about, and b maybe the woke pope isn't as woke or based as we thought he was. The economy kills. Yes, um, that is again. This is okay. This is another one of those. He's not the woke pope, right? This is this is. I I hate that. First of all, I hate that Pope Francis has this reputation because it's obviously false. It's anyone paying attention. But the problem is that a lot of people don't pay attention, especially a lot of people outside the church. And so the media gets to spin what Pope Francis says however they want. And in a lot of cases, that is to sound nice to people outside outside the church, like I was saying earlier, uh, to the enemies of the church, frankly, such as. Right. So the other thing that, that saddens me about this is that I think that it is in large part the fault of Maybe I I don't want to be I don't want to be uncharitable about this, but if, I've said this before. I think it is in large part due to, I mean, first of all, the the malicious secular news media, who who are desperate to have an ally in the on the pontificate, but in the papacy, sorry, I guess. But also, I think in large part it is due to Pope Francis' naivete when it comes to mass media and when it comes to, uh perceptions by the secular world that he says things that are very often very easily misinterpreted and that that if he had very carefully thought things through like somebody like uh um pope benedict benedict 16th would have um because he was he was a he was a philosopher he was a well-renowned philosopher and theologian long before he was pope uh he was he was the, the director of the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith for years. Uh, he was a very careful thinker and a very, very methodical philosopher. He wouldn't have done this sort of thing, and he didn't do this sort of thing. Uh, but Pope Francis is, 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 he's, he is less careful and precise about a lot of things, which can lead to a lot of, uh, a lot of unfortunate misinterpretations. And I, I think most of the blame does have to go to the secular media, but some of the blame does have to fall on, on Pope Francis' naivete. So... Let's get back to the rest. Um, I think it still lands pretty well. Okay, so like I said in my previous videos on Jordan Peterson, the point here was not to own Peterson or show that he's dumb or laugh at him, right? It's to show that as a former academic and as a highly influential public intellectual, he has a responsibility to know what he's talking about and to speak not from a position of presumed authority, but someone earnestly engaging with the traditions that he's writing and speaking about. And it seems that once again, Peterson is speaking incredibly confidently about a topic, um, you know, Christianity, more specifically the theology and philosophy of Catholicism, that he doesn't really understand. And, and probably the best critique once again, the the, hypocr the hypocrisy of this is hilarious. That that I uh, I'm okay. Yes, I do study a good deal of the the history and the doctrine of Catholicism. I am Catholic. Uh, there's a lot I could say about this, but and and there's a lot I know about this. But I'm not a theologian. I don't pretend to be a theologian. I I I I would be interested in becoming a theologian at some point someday, but I'm not one. And yet I am able to point out a lot of very obvious errors. And then especially a lot of gross misinterpretations of what Dr. Peterson has said in what you've said here. So I read of Peterson's version of Christianity came from Daniel Burston, who writes that when Peterson talks about theological issues, he only invokes a Paul Tillich called the vertical or transcendental dimension of faith, the realm of transcendent and other or inner worldly concerns. The idea that religious faith must also be lived out in the world on the horizontal axis in the pursuit of peace and social justice never seems to cross his mind. Uh okay, again, that is the more fundamental and more important aspect is the man's relationship to God. One is to love God above all things, and the second is like the first to love one's neighbor as oneself. There's a reason that the two that the two fundamental commandments go in that order, that one follows from the other, <clears throat> that our love of neighbor as oneself follows from our uh, our love of God above all things. Right? Yes, the second aspect, the the horizontal aspect, if you will, is important, but it's only important because the primary aspect, the vertical aspect, is important first. All right, maybe maybe he makes a mistake like that, but I don't think he does. Again, I don't think that he does. I think that he's 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 emphasizing a, a, the principle of solid of uh, subsidiarity as this kind of counterbalance to to solidarity. As I was saying earlier, I think that again he does think he does emphasize the 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 incredible importance of one's social interactions 
If he didn't, he wouldn't he would not practice psychology. He wouldn't practice, uh, he wouldn't do, uh, he would not advise people to do anything that is, uh, is, is, is irreducibly social, which he does, right? He absolutely does. Uh, just not the things that you want him to. Um, and, you know, I've talked about this throughout the video, and Burson just puts that so well, right? Peterson's faith is only one of a vertical relation to another world. And in leaving out the horizontal axis, he's missing the social, political, and intersubjective aspects of faith, which, according to many, are the whole point. So Burson goes on and... According to whom? Because those are what we call material heretics. That is incorrect. That is just strictly incorrect. Uh, if you do think that the sort of horizontal aspects of the faith, the interpersonal aspects of the faith, qua like interhuman personal, um, are the fundamental and the, the most important elements of the faith, you are fundamentally not Christian. Okay. If that is the the emphasis, the importance of faith for you, then and, and therefore you are you are you're placing your relationship to God as secondary to your relationship to your fellow man, you are an idolater. And that is that that's that is a form of apostasy. That is not the Christian faith. And this, by the way, this is very precisely. What he was talking about, what Dr. Peterson was talking about, where was it? Um, was it when he was talking with Peugeot? I believe it was. Um, right When he was pointing out this, this what a timestamp, maybe. Um, it was where, when he was talking about this, this idea that, that our, it, it, that if we reduce Christianity, if we re, if we eliminate all of the the supernatural aspects, if we eliminate our relationship to God, that all that's left is this interpersonal, ideological, political uh, system, and that that is meaningless. We don't need that. That that's not Christianity. He was absolutely spot on, and he was warning against this precise view, and he was absolutely right to do so writes that any serious student of the Bible knows that the prophetic call for justice is integral to the Judeo-Christian tradition. And it's an yes, okay, it is integral, but it is not essential. It is secondary. Okay, um, and also I have hesitation. I, I, uh, I uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition raises red flags for me. Um, biblical tradition is more, more academically serious. Judeo-Christian tradition sounds really it has it has a lot of political implications to it rather than rather than historical scholarly, etc. That that is now, to be fair, uh, Jordan Peterson uses Judeo-Christian fairly often, and I've criticized him for it in the past. I don't think it's I don't think it's the the proper way of describing it. Anyway, sorry. Neglect by anyone intent on carrying this tradition forward is an omission that calls for serious reflection. Um and uh Okay, yeah, again, it is important, but it's of secondary importance. It's important because our relationship with God is important first. As person goes on to write, you know, this is the aspect of faith that led Dietrich Bonhoeffer to try to take down Hitler, MLK Jr. to rally to abolish segregation and dismantle Jim Crow, and Catholic activists like Dorothy Day and the Berrigan Brothers to commit acts of resistance and protest of the Vietnam War. Um, now, it's, it's also what it's also what lead uh, Catholic protesters today to say uh, March for Life, to oppose abortion, to oppose uh, gender reassignment to oppose um, uh, sterilization, to oppose euthanasia, to oppose uh, COVID mandates, to oppose, um, oh, what, is, what else What else do we have? All, all of these, these various things, which are gross violations of human rights, uh, gross violations of human dignity, because we do have a sort of, a, a sort of relationship, interrelationship with one another. Um, but again, doing so cannot, under any circumstances, Take a secondary or take a uh, a primary role over and above our uh, our our piety, right? Our our relationship to God. If, in other words, you can't miss mass to go to the march for life, that is never acceptable. Yes, the march for life is good. It is a good thing to do. It is an important it is an important movement in our society, and my contribution to it is something. Now again, it's it's far beyond the scope of my particular control, but my contribution to it is is closer to my sphere of control. Closer, but maybe still a bit outside. 
However, my obligations to my family, my obligations most, most for like ultimately and foremost to God come first because they have to, because of course they do. That's why these further social obligations have any significance whatsoever is because of the obligations which are closer to me and closer to my relationship with God. To be clear, this video is by no means some apology for religion, right? But, you know, the examples of folks Clearly. like Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King Jr., and Dorothy Day are reminders that for many folks in that tradition, faith is about fighting for justice and equality in the here and now, and not an individualist moral system that says, like, make your bed, find your wife, conquer the land. Because when Peterson... That's not what he's saying at all. Oh my god, he's doing the thing again where he's just being wildly uncharitable. Uh, but he's also uh, saying that religion is fundamentally about our about the interpersonal, which it is interpersonal between you and God. You and God are four persons. Great. There you go. That's what religion is about. And that will lead you to doing things with and for your other human, uh, your fellow human beings. But it'll only lead you to it. It's not it's not about that. It reduces Christianity to an individualist tale of adventure for young men wanting to actualize their power and wrangle a wife along the way. He's not just mischaracterizing a rich and complicated tradition. He's co-opting theological principles to justify his own specific neo-Darwinian view of reality. And it's worth noting in research in this video, I, I read something from Sam Rocha, who is a philosophy professor at the University of British Columbia, and he said that Peterson's research on intelligence quotients is pseudoscientific, with links to 19th century race science and ethnoscience that gave rise to segregation. And okay, because it shares some conclusions with, with, uh, with research that has in the past been used for for nefarious purposes like again research into into intelligence quotients is is a serious uh, is a very serious field some the fact that a, if a philosopher referred to it as pseudoscience is uh, again purely because of historical associations come on that's unserious and you know is anyone familiar with the abrahamic tradition knows all these faiths are grounded in various senses of community and in many ways involved no what I, only insofar as human life finds itself within community and that the faith is passed on through community that's the sense in which it finds itself grounded in community you are you you are purely extolling secular virtue here contrary to christian virtue challenging and expanding one's community. Now, that's why Jacques Derrida, who's one of Peterson's big nemeses, develops his theory of absolute hospitality in conversation with Judaism. And why folks from Thomas Munzer to Martin Luther King Jr. to the Latin American liberation theologians rightly considered the primary ethical call of Christianity to pertain to creating communities of justice. It's also why lots of non-religious philosophers, from Ernst Bloch to Alain Badu to Slavoj Zizek, have positively utilized the aspect of Christianity in their work, as they see a liberatory potential that prioritizes community over individual interest. As that is precisely what Peterson used to say about Christianity. That it, that it is, like I said, like I was saying in, in the context of like Carl Benjamin, that, that Christianity is conducive to a kind of social cohesion, social flourishing, uh, and uh, psychological well-being and all that stuff. But that it's, but that it's truth value is, is unimportant. But now he's actually taking the truth value seriously and you're getting mad at him. Ernst Bloch writes on his book, Atheism and Christianity. The point, however, to be made against all pseudo-enlightenment, which sees religion as a spent force caught between Moses and Darwin is this. The counterblow against the oppressor is biblical too, and that is why it has always been suppressed or distorted from the serpent on. It was the counterblow that gave the Bible its popularity and its appeal. But it seems like what Peterson's doing is taking a faith with a clear social ethic, one which always uses its transcendent orientation to facilitate horizontal action, and he turns it into an individualist enterprise where God exists solely to help young men become Joseph Campbell's archetypal hero. You know, you know there's lots of issues here, but two of it, seem, it seems like he's implying here that Peterson is inverting the is, is sort of reinverting the the social relationship here and saying that that the powerful should be powerful. He, he's, that he's that Peterson is sort of being Nietzschean here, despite how often he he explicitly rejects the Nietzschean ethic. Um, it seems like he's saying that that he that that because Christianity has historically and rightly uh, been used as a tool of the oppressed against the oppressor. A sort of philosophical tool a philosophical framework of the oppressed against the oppressor and that that what peterson is doing is trying to suppress that again i think he's I'm trying to remember which video it was but i think he's done this before where he assumes that that our society is largely controlled by uh the, a sort of neo-christendom rather than being a a sort of mid-leftist secular uh secular hegemon uh that 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 has largely pushed religious discourse and especially traditional religious discourse, Catholicism uh, in particular, uh, into a into a little far corner. He basically, again, 
assumes that he as the the vaguely vaguely marxist leftist is the underdog minority in society which which again observably is not the case but okay whatever one of the most important ones as i see it are that peterson is using his position of authority to preach a mischaracterized version of christianity aimed at young men searching for meaning and purpose and second that in doing so all he's really doing is using the guise and authority of Christian theology to add divine legitimacy to his own form of kind of reactionary conservative thought. So if you've been watching and reading Peterson's work on religion, I would simply encourage you uh, to do what he hasn't taken the time to do and, you know, do some reading for yourself, whether it's the Bible or the works of philosophers like Augustine, Aquinas, Kierkegaard, or, or contemporary theologians and philosophers of religion. Just go read some stuff. Um, but before yeah, okay, yes. Um, and again, I think that that saying that young men in particular will find meaning and significance in the Catholic faith is absolutely a good thing. And I cannot imagine why you would disagree with that. At least that aspect, which he seems to be, he seems to be objected to that. I don't, I cannot imagine why you would object to that sort of thing. Unless as the stereotype might say, you have some opposition to young men finding meaning in life, which I mean, it's, it's hard to fight those stereotypes when you walk so hard into them like this. Before we go, uh, I want to give the last word to Peterson in an act of humility okay, and see. grace. Think again, sunshine. And if you want to understand how Peterson does this in postmodern... All right, I'll stop it there. All right, uh, it, this video has gone altogether too long. Thank you uh, for sticking this out with me. Yeah, that was really bad. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for, for forcing me through that. It's been two hours. Uh, that was two hours of my life and two hours of yours. Or maybe you listened on double speed and it was only an hour of your life. In which case, thank God you should at least. Uh, <laughs> Oh man, no, that was really bad. That was that was uh, that was hostile, disingenuous, and uh, and displayed either a profound lack of reading comprehension or well, and or, um, man, just blatant hostility to not only the Catholic faith but but to Peterson. So again, yeah, I uh, that was awful. That was really bad. Anyway, that's all I really have to say here. So uh, I, uh, despite everything, um, I guess I had a good time. I enjoy these. These are still fun, regardless of uh, regardless of the actual content here. So uh, go ahead and feel free to join my Discord down there. Feel free to, uh, uh, if you if you gain some value from this, I I cordially invite you, and I would be gratefully thankful. I would be eternally grateful. Uh, I, I can't talk anymore. It's been two hours. Uh, if you can. Uh, if you can donate a little bit down to ko-fi.com slash Professor McCoy, if you enjoyed this, if you got some value or some something from this, uh, throw some back at me. I would greatly appreciate it. It really helps me continue to do this sort of thing. Uh, if you like seeing this, I want to keep doing it. So by all means, help me do it. Uh, even if that's as simple as liking this video, subscribing, uh, jumping in the Discord, uh, chatting about it. Anyway, that's all I got for now. So thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. Remember... Don't be safe, be well, and more importantly, be good.